0303 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 p.m. on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Tired of the usual focus tested pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9 30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's 12 o'clock on Monday, the 11th of March. Lee joins Nigel. Lee Anderson dramatically quits the Conservatives today to join the Reform Party, becoming their first MP. Will other Tories follow? And who could be next? Kate apologises. Princess Catherine urges, issues an official apology over the manipulated photograph of her and her children released on Mothering Sunday. She says she was simply experimenting with editing, but is now facing calls to release the original picture. And the Met Police under fire. The police have been accused of pandering to extremists as they arrest a man with a sign calling Hamas terrorists, but allow pro-Palestine protesters to celebrate attacks on British ships. It's a big day in Westminster. The first MP for Reform UK. Lee Anderson has sensationally quit the Conservative Party, of course, after his suspension, and joined the party of Richard Tice and Nigel Farage. I mean, there was huge amounts of suspicion. Lots of people thought that he might do. He's having lots of talks, as he openly admits, with the Reform Party, with Richard Tice and co. He's made that decision. Do you at home think it was the, it is the right decision? Do you think that maybe he should call a by-election now? He's defected to another party. The people of Ashfield didn't vote for him under the banner of reform, did they? So do you think it's time for an election, a by-election or perhaps with a general election less than a year away? Of course, Lee Anderson himself signed up to an amendment in the House of Commons not so long ago saying that any defector from one party to another should have the option of facing a by-election that constituents could call a recall petition in such circumstances but he's not calling a by-election. Big questions. But more than that, who else might be next? With the Conservative Party trailing in the polls, might more MPs think it's time to jump ship? We'll have all of the latest gossip, rumour and salacious stories after your headlines with France. It's with Sam. Tom, Emily, thank you very much. Good afternoon from the newsroom. It's just gone 12 o'clock and uh, we start with a recap of that news that Lee Anderson has become Reform UK's first MP in a blow to Rishi Sunak. 
Mr Anderson was stripped of the Conservative whip after refusing to apologise for claiming that Islamists had, he said, got control of the London mayor. Well, speaking in London this morning, he said his new party would allow him to speak out on behalf of millions of British voters. Parliament doesn't seem to understand what many British people want. And quite frankly, some of them need to get out more. I made some remarks a few weeks back about the London Mayor, for which I was stripped of the whip in the, from the Conservative Party. And let me be clear right now, on this stage, I will not apologise. It is no secret that I've been talking to my friends in Reform for a while, and Reform UK has offered me the chance to speak out in Parliament on behalf of millions of people up and down the country who feel that they're not being listened to. Well, after uh, welcoming Lee Anderson to Reform UK, the party's leader, Richard Tice, said that the first MP for the party is trusted by voters. Lee's going to be our champion of the Red Wall. This is going to boost us in the polls rapidly. And here's my prediction. By the summer, we're going to close that gap with the Tories. We're now about 5 or 6% behind on a couple of polls. That could close to uh, almost zero if we keep making the progress we're making. To other news, and the Princess of Wales has today publicly apologised for an altered family photo that was released by Kensington Palace. Posting to social media, she admitted that, like many amateur photographers, she occasionally experiments with editing, she said, adding that she was sorry for any confusion it may have caused. Well, the Mother's Day image that was taken by the Prince of Wales was withdrawn by various global photo agencies after suspicions that a number of edits may have been made. Three former Conservative Home Secretaries are calling for a united front to tackle extremism from Islamists and far-right groups. In a joint statement, Dame Priti Patel, Sir Sajid Javid and Amber Rudd are both urging Labour and the Conservatives to work together to understand and combat the issue. It comes as Community Secretary Michael Gove is preparing to announce a new government definition of extremism. Meanwhile, more than 50 victims of Islamist terror attacks have signed a separate letter condemning anti-Muslim hate, saying that it's important to separate extremists from the majority of other British Muslims. Meanwhile, the government has pledged over £117 million to safeguard mosques, Muslim schools and community centres over the next four years. The funding that's been unveiled today follows the Prime Minister's promise to allocate more than £70 million to protect Jewish community sites. Politicians, tech companies and financial institutions are meeting in London today to tackle international fraud. The event that's hosted by the British government is the first of its kind. Security Minister Tom Tugendhat told GB News this morning that the government is working to protect the British people. Already we're leading on bringing uh, fraud down, so it's down 13% year on year, and we've already led globally with the online fraud charter, which is a huge moment where we've got tech companies, the largest tech companies and other companies, telecoms companies, to work together to protect the British people. And today, that's all about bringing that to partners. Some more royal news and the Queen is leading the royal family at this year's Commonwealth Day service as the King continues his cancer treatment. Her Majesty, accompanied by the Prince of Wales and other key members of the royal family, are gathering at Westminster Abbey for the annual celebration. This year's event is drawing on the theme of resilience against a backdrop of health worries among the royal family. Though he'll miss today's service, His Majesty has recorded a video message reaffirming his commitment to serve the 56 member countries, he says, to the best of his ability. And finally, to the US, where last night's Oscars were dominated by nuclear bomb epic Oppenheimer, winning seven awards, including Best Director for Christopher Nolan and Best Actor for Killian Murphy, here's the moment that he claimed the top acting honour. We made a film about the, the man who created the atomic bomb and... For better or for worse, we're all living in Oppenheimer's world, so I would really like to dedicate this to the peacemakers everywhere. One of the other biggest cheers of the night went to Emma Stone, who took home her second award for Best Actress, this time for black comedy Poor Things. But it was a night of bad luck for songwriting legend Diane Warren. The writer of 33 top ten singles has so far notched up 15 nominations, but sadly zero wins. Last night's award for Best Original Song instead went to Billie Eilish and Phineas O'Connell for the track What Was I Made For, which was featured, you may remember, in Barbie. 
Those are the headlines. Plenty more to come with Tom and Emily. In the meantime, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the code there on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Good afternoon, Britain, seven minutes past 12, and Lee Anderson, the former deputy chairman of the Conservative Party, has sensationally defected to Reform UK, becoming the party's first member of parliament. In a move that shook Westminster, the MP for Ashfield confirmed he's been in talks with Reform UK for a while and concluded his speech by declaring, I want my country back. Well, for more on this, let's speak to GB News political correspondent Olivia Utley, who was at the press conference this morning in Westminster. And Olivia, the room has emptied out there now, but uh, quite a shock for many people. It was quite a shock for many people, caused a real ripple in Westminster this morning. There are those who write off this defection, some who even say that it isn't really a defection at all. Lee Anderson was one of the Conservative MPs who's been on reform watch for a while now. And then, of course, he was suspended from the Conservative Party over remarks he made about Sadiq Khan a couple of weeks ago, which were deemed to be Islamophobic. You know, there are those in the Conservative Party who I have spoken to who said Lee Anderson didn't really have any choice but to join reform and this 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 defection can't be extrapolated we're not going to we're not expecting a whole load of conservative MPs to defect now this was a sort of extraordinary set of circumstances and a pretty extraordinary character in Lee Anderson himself all of that said you can't really just brush this under the carpet Rishi Sunak himself obviously has a lot of faith in Lee Anderson's ability to speak to those red wall voters, those voters who would be absolutely key to the Conservatives holding on to power. Rishi Sunak himself made Lee Anderson deputy chairman for that very reason. So the Conservatives can't exactly just turn around now and say, well, Lee Anderson wasn't an asset in the first place. It's very clear that he was an asset to them. It is also true that Richard Tice has implied time and time again that there are other uh MPs who are prepared to defect to reform. Of course, he would be big, bigging up his party's prospects, but he made a direct implication in the press conference today that there are Labour MPs in talk with reform. I think something else which really struck me from today is the Conservatives keep uh, trying to sort of get across the message that if you vote for reform, it is simply uh, a vote for Labour. The idea is that the reform will end up splitting the Conservative vote and handing seats to Labour. Now, that might well be true in Wellingborough, for example, if every single voter who voted for reform in that by-election had voted for the Conservatives instead, the Conservatives would have won. But it's becoming increasingly clear that reform don't really care about that. What Richard Tice said when I asked him if a vote for reform was a vote for Labour, he said the two main parties are exactly the same. We need something completely different. And it's quite possible that voters will feel the same. They'll feel that perhaps the Conservatives Conservatives no longer have a sort of God-given right to the Conservative vote. So that threat from reform is feeling pretty real. And even if it does end up in just splitting the Conservative vote, even if reform ends up in uh, winning very few seats in a general election, that's hardly a consolation to uh, the, the Conservative Party or to reform. And Olivia, hearing that uh, as many as nine Conservative MPs are in advanced talks with Reform Party, that's a source close to the Reform Party. Any idea who they might be, who those nine Conservatives might be? <laughs> Well, there are, there are those who've been on sort of reform watch for a while. There are those who've written their letters of no confidence into to Rishi Sunak. Someone like Andrea Jenkins, perhaps, who has been uh, very, very vocal about her dislike of the Prime Minister. There was, of course, uh, Simon Clark, who said that, a former Trussite minister, who said that uh, we were, that the Conservatives were heading for the iceberg and he was the, the whistleblower who was calling that out. Perhaps someone like that could be persuaded to effect to reform. Then there are also the characters, you know, the, 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 the solid right of centre Conservative MPs who have been very, very vocal on immigration for a long time now. Suella Bravman clearly isn't happy with the direction that her party is going on immigration. All of those people, though, have said so far that they are not planning to defect to reform. That said, Lee Anderson said just a few weeks ago that he wasn't planning to defect to reform. So I guess we'll have to watch and wait. I'm fascinated to see if uh, Richard Tice's 
this prediction that Labour MPs could defect will actually mm -hmm. turn out to amount to anything? Well, no, it's a fascinating question. But for now, Olivia Utley, thank you very much. Live from that room where it all happened this morning. <laughs> Let's speak now with the political correspondent at The Spectator, James Heal. And James, what does this mean going forward for the Conservative Party? They have now dipped by some measures below 20 points in the polls and reform is creeping up. Well, today made it much harder for Rishi Sunak to pretend that he is going to be the only right-wing candidate in this uh, forthcoming general election. Uh, it splits the right of British politics. Uh, it means that reform now have a spokesman within Parliament, uh, and it therefore makes the media speculation one about splits, defections, uh, and potentially reform being a big thorn in the side of the Conservatives, rather than doing what Rishi Sunak wants, which is taking the fight to the Labour Party uh, and making this really a two-horse race with him, between him and Keir Starmer. So it's been a bad day for Rishi Sunak, not least because just 12 months ago he made him Deputy Party Chairman. Mm. Bit of a known goal, isn't it? Well, it, it is for Rishi Sunak in the sense that, um, you know, there was always a sense with, Re with uh, Leanders, he was a bit of a mercurial... Uh, player on the pitch. Uh, he, on the one hand, was very uh, straight talking and that could cause issues for him. Um, as the day he was appointed deputy chairman, um, he came out and supported uh, capital punishments in an interview with The Spectator. But on the other hand, he was very popular within the party and doing a lot of the associations going around the country. A lot of MPs love having him speak in their patch. And the danger is, of course, is that by him defecting, he could split the party in terms of activists mm. at a time when it's already feeling very disheartened and really be uh, a, a massive sort of wedge issue at a time when the Conservatives are, as you say, Tom, um, potentially 20% in the polls. So this could be most damaging at the uh, grassroots level. But let's say it's true that there are nine Conservative MPs in advanced talks with Reform UK. If those potentially defected, can the Conservative Party really call itself a broad church? It always says that it is. It always says it has all versions of conservatism. Uh, but if, you know, potentially that many defect, then uh, is that no longer true? I think we should take a note of scepticism and reform uh, talk about defections. They've said so for years. It was part of the Brexit Party and UKIP playbook. Often there was a lot of talk. There were some defections, of course, but um, they tend to be far less than the talk amounted to. Um, so I'll await to see with interest if reports of those nine do materialise. Uh, what I will say is we key, key where, where those areas are actually are. I mean, are they going to be in seats of majorities less than 5,000? Or are they going to be in blue wall areas of 25,000? And I think that will be of interest. I think Rishi Sunak's clearly staked his future on the blue wall of trying to keep to sort of 30% of the polls rather than sort of, you know, re-get back together the 2019 coalition. Um, so I will be interested to see who they are if they really exist, uh, and of course the circumstances in which they defect, because Lee Anderson was a whipless wonder, rather than sort of you know a Tory minister or someone with the Conservative whip, he's someone who went chose to go from being suspended uh, to the party. So for that reason, I think perhaps his defection, while pretty important, uh, is slightly different from say perhaps the defections of Douglas Carswell and Mark Reckless in 2014, both of whom went from the Conservatives, both of whom triggered by-elections. And it is that by-election question that helped UKIP gain a lot of momentum, gain four million votes in the 2015 election, that sense of sort of inevitability and growth of a party that perhaps Reform UK is missing out on here through not calling a by-election, perhaps because they think they'll lose it. Well, I think reform are definitely going to be something the Tories need to very much be worried about. But they have so far slightly underperformed in elections. Even in Wellingborough, where they threw the kitchen sink at that by-election, they only got 13%. Uh, UKIP in 2015 won 20% there. Um, similarly, uh, in the recent by-election um, in Rochdale, they still only came sixth of the vote, despite a lot of sort of talk there about it being a two-horse race. So I think that yeah, while reform certainly has a lot of investment behind it uh, in terms of a lot of media interest, and now they've got Lee Anderson, um, someone who's seen as a Red Wall Rottweiler, um, I do think that they actually need to back it up with electoral performances. And I'll be therefore very interested to see with the forthcoming Blackpool South by-election, uh, a Leave voting area, uh, the most deprived seat that the Conservatives currently hold at the last election, um, how reform can do there and I really think they need to do a good performance there if they want to actually back up what the polls are saying and that's what I'll be looking for when that by-election comes around. Absolutely, wow. really, really, really key one. Looking back to previous by-elections, it was Eastleigh when UKIP leapfrogged over mm. the Conservative Party, took, took the second place, Conservatives into third, started to be able to say it was a strong force. If that happens in Blackpool South, perhaps this conversation about underperformance in by-elections starts to change. Uh, but James Heal, thank you very much for joining us here. Um, thank you very much indeed. I wonder how Lee Anderson will play it in the, in the chamber.
in the House of Commons. Will he massively stick the boot in to the Conservatives, even though he was only uh, part of the party weeks ago? Or will he, I don't know, take the high ground? What do you think? Well, I think he was very keen to stick the boot into Labour. He was, of course, formally a Labour councillor. Of course. Became a Conservative MP, was happy to stick the boot in. Uh, now he's a Reform MP. Perhaps, again, the boot, as James Hill was saying, the Red Wall Rottweiler. I'm interested to see where he sits in the House of Commons. Is he going to, obviously, cross the floor, sit on those opposition benches? Who will he sit next to? Probably not Jeremy Corbyn. Probably not the Lib Dems. He might find place sitting next to perhaps the DUP. Let's have a look when he takes his seat a little bit later today. Yes, keep your views coming in. Lots of them are coming in. Whether you think this is the right move for Lee Anderson and uh, whether you think this is the massive blow that some people are seeing it as for Rishi Sunak. Let us know your views. GBviews at GBnews.com. And what do you make of what he said? I want my country back. Does he speak for millions of people in this country? Well, the Princess of Wales has apologised for confusion related to a poorly photoshopped picture of her and her children. It's the first official picture of the princess since her surgery, but she's now facing calls to release the original. We'll have all the details after this. This is Good Afternoon Britain on GB News. Patrick Christie's Tonight. Weekdays from 9pm. Well, to cut a very long story uh, short, I was the chaplain in, in a school and uh, people asked me to preach on how come they were told they had to accept uh, the LGBT stuff in a Christian school. I thought that was a fair question. So I said, ultimately, no, you don't have to accept anybody else's ideas. You make up your own minds. Uh, and so on topics like uh, the marriage being between a man and a woman, biological sex being real, gender identity not making perfect sense, therefore can't be entirely true. I said, you know, you may adopt the church's position on that and um, respect the people you disagree with, but you make up your own mind. Um, for which, as you say, I was reported to prevent the anti-terror watchdog, um, secular safeguarding authorities, the teaching regulation agency, disclosure and borrowing service, all of whom eventually cleared me, uh, but I lost my job at the school, and that's why there's legal action ongoing. That's an incredibly powerful sermon, <laughs> to be fair. Well, um, uh, what do you make of Justin Welby and his current role? I've obviously rattled off quite a few things there. I mean, you've had personal experience of feeling quite abandoned. What's your view on his position? Well, I, he's doing a very difficult job, in fairness to him. My personal view is... Perhaps he's not doing the best job of it. Um, I'll, I'll be diplomatic about it. In a sense, I'm on the wrong side of things as far as he's concerned, I guess. Um, not, a, not a word of support, not a whisper from anyone in the Church of England's hierarchy for someone simply saying, you may accept the Church of England's own teaching. And, and I can't quite see how he can square that in his own head, but you know, uh, he would have to answer to that himself, I guess. I, I mean, the irony is that, uh, though this is obviously through no fault of your own, the Church of England has recently baptised people who have gone on to not just be referred to prevent, but actually commit acts of terrorism. Meanwhile, you were referred to prevent for essentially uh, teaching. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Well, lots of you are getting in touch about Lee Anderson and his decision to defect to the Reform Party. Uh, Caroline says the Conservative Party is not changing because they are blinkered, they're not listening to the public. Lee comes from a working 
class background and so he can speak on behalf of the working people. He's done the grafting before being a politician. So a fan of uh, Lee Anderson there. And Brian says, all that will happen if you vote reform is that you will have three cheeks of the same backside, to paraphrase the only decent MP in Parliament. Talking Goodness about George Galloway me. there, presumably. That's, that's a line that George Galloway used in the 2012 um, uh, West Bradford by-election. He's a broken record, he isn't he? Well, that was talking about the Lib Dems as well. I'm not sure many people are talking about the Lib Dems today. <laughs> Um, I found it interesting, though, watching this uh, this announcement. Perhaps the and the Reform Party is a very slick party, but perhaps they haven't got everything right about how they present themselves. Um, for those watching on television, take a look at this. There was a moment when Lee Anderson started to dance with a flag. Uh, there he is. Oh no! Sort of, oh, got the really bad flag placement there. You've had a lot of jokes on social media about sort of. Hiding behind a flag. Oh, they moved the it. it. And they had to move it along. There it is, the ah, disappearing flag. No. Well, there you go. A very patriotic uh... image there, isn't there? British well, flags, Union Jack everywhere. I think yeah, it's very nice to have a Union Jack behind you mm. when you're a politician. I think that's a good thing. It shows <laughs> that you're a patriot. Standing behind one, uh, perhaps less advisable. Uh, that, that, that media advice is for free there, Reform UK. And Ray says, I like Lee Anderson, agree with a lot of what he says. Yes, he might be the first MP for reform, but he will probably be the last as well. Like UKIP before and reform now, lots of people support them, but not enough will defect to vote for them in a general election. And that, of course, is the conundrum that the Reform Party face. Yes, they may be polling on 13%, mm. 14%, which is very high indeed, higher than the Liberal Democrats, but will that translate to seats mm. in a general election? It's just the system we live under. Yeah, the UKIP um, came third by number of votes in the 2015 general election and won one member of parliament. That was Clacton. Um, <laughs> but Helen is... says this is the best news ever, so she's happy. She wants to put the great back into Britain. Mm, I think it'll be a lot of, lot of um, conservative associations mm. around the country who feel very uh, unsure of what to do at the moment because he was such a big... Um, figure amongst those conservative grassroots. Yeah, the grassroots love him. The mm. grassroots do love him. So it is a loss for Rishi Sunak and the Conservative Party, but it was their choice. But another big story today, the Princess of Wales has apologised for the confusion over a Mother's Day photograph released by Kensington Palace yesterday. In a statement released on social media, Kate said, like many amateur photographers, I do occasionally experiment with editing. And she, may, and she made sure to say she hopes everyone's celebrating a very happy Mother's Day. Well, Kensington Palace said it would not be reissuing the original unedited photograph of Kate and her children, which has been pulled by major international picture agencies. Yes, this comes as the Prince of Wales, the Queen and other members of the royal family are set to attend the annual Commonwealth Day service at Westminster Abbey a little later on. So let's speak to our royal correspondent, Cameron Walker, live at Westminster Abbey. And Cameron, of course, we have to start with this picture. I mean, what a monumental step to the back step, I mean, I, I, whatever you want to call it, it, it it's kerfuffle. not gone... Kerfuffle. kerfuffle. Fantastic. What a kerfuffle. I mean, it's a complete PR disaster, Tom, to be honest with you. I think it shows just how seriously that perhaps they're taking it, that the princess herself has issued an apology. I understand, as was alluded to in her message, that she edited it herself. Minor adjustments is the phrase I've been told by uh, a royal source. I'm also told that the Prince and Princess of Wales were really keen, but it was an amateur family snap showing their close family units. Of course, the whole point of that image in the first place was to try and reassure the public that the princess is recovering fine from her abdominal surgery, and it was a nice uh, day to do it on Mother's Day, but of course it's spectacularly backfired and has only fueled the fire of these conspiracy theories online. It appears to be an innocent mistake from the Princess of Wales that perhaps she, as she admits in, the, in that statement, that she is an amateur photographer, an amateur uh, editor of the images. It was Prince William, of course, who took the image in the first place. But it raises a wider issue here. First of all, Kensington Palace uh, clearly did not uh, thoroughly check the image before they distributed it to the agencies. Then four major international agencies pulled the image because it had been manipulated. They have their own reputations to uphold, of course, because media uh, organisations around the world expect those agencies to supply them with trustworthy news photograph. Then this morning, the Press Association here in the UK, who speaks to the palace re regularly, did the same thing. They pulled the image. So I think Kensington Palace had no p choice uh, but to release some kind of statements. But the wider problem here is if 
the Prince and Princess of Wales um, insist on releasing their own material and therefore have overall control of the image, the issue we've discovered this morning is that it has the potential to damage public trust in what they uh, give us. And the fact at the moment they cho choose for these private intimate family moments to not have an independent trusted news photographer there to then distribute it uh, to the world's press on their behalf, uh, I think perhaps is a question they will be asking themselves this morning. That's an extremely good point, Cameron, that they go went it alone and it went a bit wrong. They should have relied on expert photographers and, and the palace and everything done properly. Um, but just this photo, I mean, there's been so much speculation over what exactly has been photoshopped, what's been edited, what was Catherine doing with this photo. I wasn't sure whether perhaps it was an old photo of Catherine that they'd sort of mashed up together and mixed parts with other parts, or is it just a very minor sort of tweak? I think it's more than a minor tweak. We're talking more here than uh, just a simple airbrush or changing the colour contrast to make her look slightly more tanned, for example. Uh, what I don't buy into is the conspiracy theorist that that photograph was not taken last week by the Prince of Wales of her, his wife and their three children. I suspect, although this is of course just speculation, that uh, the Prince took a number of photographs at that moment last week uh, in order to release it on Mother's Day and then the best bits of each photograph, if you like, were then morphed into one photograph by the Princess of Wales before being sent on to the communications team who then distributed it uh, to the world press. I suspect that, that is the most likely scenario. Of course, that's something Kensington Palace is not getting into this afternoon. But they're also not releasing the original image. So, again, it's just adding more questions. Certainly. And of course, there are lots of modern smartphone apps that do this. You take three or four pictures and you can pick where your children are, are, are looking at the right direction or, or not having their hands in weird positions, although that didn't work out particularly well in this particular photograph. You like a photograph. bit of airbrushing. Um, I, uh, well, it depends, depends what it's for. <laughs> but, but Cameron, uh, this is coming, of course, on Commonwealth Day. This is supposed to be a day of celebration of an institution that the uh, king is head of, that is a big uh, part of Britain around the world. It's a big distraction, isn't it? It's a huge distraction and it's the 75th anniversary of the Commonwealth this year. 56 independent family of nations who have a common cause for peace and working together. The King has released uh, a message, a video message, which is going to be played at Westminster Abbey today. You may well notice, in fact, it's quite hard to miss if you're watching on television, the big yellow signs and flags behind me. This is the anti-monarchy group Republic, who, since the King ascended the throne, have really made themselves known and have been very noisy at these kind of big events in the royal calendar. So no doubt they will be making some noise when members of the royal family start to arrive here. But the line from the King's speech, which he will be delivering later via video message, he's already recorded it, is he will continue to serve the Commonwealth to the best of my ability. Now that phrase, best of my ability, is a phrase the late Queen used, Elizabeth II, following her Platinum Jubilee celebrations in June 2022. The King continues his regular cancer treatments, therefore he is not carrying out public engagements and he will not be physically uh, inside the Abbey. So instead, he's being represented by his, Her Majesty the Queen, the Prince of Wales and other members of the royal family. But of course, as you say, Tom, distracted by this image of the Princess of Wales and her children this morning. Well, thank you very much indeed, Cameron Walker, our royal correspondent. In a mist, all the uh, angry Republicans there, down with the crown, is yes, what so they're, they're saying. They're quite polite for protesters. They are, I mean, actually. I've seen protests that are, that are more angry, more shouty. Maybe that'll happen when the royals arrive, but um, they seem not. pretty placid as things stand. I, w I do feel a bit sorry for Princess Catherine. I mean, all of this speculation about her, and then she messes up with, a, with editing this photo, yeah. and uh, then she apologises personally on social media, leaving a sign-off, just see. I know, I can understand why she doesn't want to release the original photograph or take a new photograph, mm. be, appear to be the sort of cowed by the crowds. Mm. Sort of, she's got to be royal and sort of above it all. But if you're royal and above it all, don't use a dodgy app to this composite the your pictures. They want to be like normal people and putting up their own photos and things, but 
You're not. Mm. You're not. You've got to go through the processes, it seems. Let us know what you think. GBviews at gbnews.com. It's all a bit much. Poor Catherine. Poor Catherine. Well, an imam and an Islamic think tank leader is calling on MPs to tackle extremism through the promotion of harmonious and tolerant Muslim bodies. We'll be joined by that very man after your headlines with Sam. This is Good Afternoon Britain. Tom, Emily, thank you very much. Good afternoon from the newsroom. A recap of the headlines at 12.30. Lee Anderson has accused the Conservatives of stifling free speech as he announced his defection to Reform UK, becoming the party's first MP. Mr Anderson was stripped of the Conservative whip after refusing to apologise for claiming that Islamists had, he said, got control of the London mayor. As recently as January, Mr Anderson had said that Reform was not a proper political party. But now Reform's newest member has said that his new party would allow him to speak out on behalf of millions of British voters. Parliament doesn't seem to understand what many British people want. And quite frankly, some of them need to get out more. I made some remarks a few weeks back about the London Mayor, for which I was stripped of the whip in the, from the Conservative Party. And let me be clear right now, on this stage, I will not apologise. It is no secret that I've been talking to my friends in Reform for a while. And Reform UK has offered me the chance to speak out in Parliament on behalf of millions of people up and down the country who feel that they're not being listened to. Well, to that royal news we've been talking about throughout the course of this morning, the Princess of Wales has now publicly apologised for an altered family photo that was released by Kensington Palace. Posting to social media, she admitted that, like many amateur photographers, she occasionally experiments with editing, adding that she was sorry for any confusion it might have caused. The Mother's Day image that was taken by the Prince of Wales was withdrawn by various global photo agencies after suspicions that a number of edits may have been made. And the energy regulator Ofgem is, Off is looking at ways to protect consumers from spiralling costs amid a record number of unpaid bills. Around £3.1 billion of debts are piling up as concerns grow over the high cost of household bills. It comes after the price of energy in the average British home hit more than £3,500 a year last October. Those are the headlines. For more, you can sign up to GB News Alerts, scan the QR code there on your screen, or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. For stunning gold and silver coins you'll always value, Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. And here's a look at the markets this afternoon. The pound will buy you $1.2850 and €1.1743. The price of gold is currently £1,695.94 per ounce and the FTSE 100 is at 7,623 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Martin Dalby, weekdays from 3 p.m. President versus the Prince. Wow, what a story, Jenny. And this basically could mean Donald Trump rummaging around in these allegations in spare about Prince Harry's drug taking. And it may affect his future residency plans. And of course, lest we forget, Meghan was very outspoken of her disdain for Trump when he was voted in. Jenny, this story really gets the juices flowing. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, Donald Trump, I think most people would accept, is probably quite a vindictive man. Um, and he is a law unto himself. And he's made it very clear that uh, he, he regards Harry and Meghan as being completely on their own if he becomes president. Uh, thus far, uh, they've been somewhat, I suppose, protected by the Biden administration. There is a group, uh, a, a conservative group, who are trying to force the publication of the application that Harry filled in for his visa when he moved to America. Uh, and you know, the rules and laws on, on drug taking are quite intense over there. And the question is, did, did Harry say, as he did in his book, Spare, 
that he had taken quite a considerable number of drugs. Did he say that on his visa application? Uh, but Trump has made a lot of uh, quite unpleasant noises saying that he'll be on his own and it could threaten his uh, residency in, in the United States. California, the public enemy number one of Donald Trump, actually make the Sussexers more popular. Yeah, that's a very good point, Martin. I think so. You know, um, they will be seen as victims of, of Trump and uh, their liberal credentials will be fated and celebrated, as they are already, I suppose, in California. So they could become uh, new uh, heroes and heroine um, of modern day politics. So we, we will have to wait and see. But Trump has definitely got an influence. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's 38 minutes past 12. And the, the founder of an Islamic think tank, the Os Oxford Institute for British Islam, is calling on ministers to bring together a group of tolerant and inclusive Muslims to tackle extremism. Yes, the historian and imam says the government should use Muslims, including scholars and activists, to promote harmonious living. Is this the answer to tackle extremism? Well, joining us now is the founder of the OBI, Dr. Tag Haji. And uh, thank you so much for making the time for us today. Just in your sort of brief elevator pitch, what is the big idea here? The idea is for us to live together. It doesn't matter if you're Jew, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, Jedi. It doesn't really matter. We're all British and we really need to work together and live harmoniously and, and uh, with mutual respect and uh, love and care and compassion for everyone. And that's the, uh, the message in a, in, in a nutshell. Now, Tag, the government are trying to pinpoint exactly what extremism means. We've seen a lot of quite extreme preachers, for example, from the Muslim community. How, do you, how does extremism need to be tackled within the Muslim community? Does it need to be tackled from within rather than top-down direction from government? You, 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 you've hit the nail on the head here. Uh, Coming from outside doesn't really work. Uh, we need to tackle the whole f idea and concepts of extremism, fanaticism, radicalism, militancy, whatever you wish to label it as such, from within. And so that means you only can do it within, in terms of the theology of Islam. So uh, Tony Blair some years said that education, education, education was the issue. I would say now for Muslims today, especially in the UK, it's theology, theology, theology. Unless we... Uh, cut the legs of this uh, poisonous, venomous uh, ideology that does, doesn't have a Quranic basis. It comes from non-Quranic sources. Unless we tackle that, we will always have some elements and some form and manifestation of radicalism and militancy in the society. So it, it behoves Muslims from within, open-minded, progressive, liberal, integ integrated Muslims. Mm. As you can see, I don't have a beard. You don't have to wear a certain garb of clothing. All of this is nonsensical. Mm. It's got nothing to do with Islam. Islam's got no culture. M uh, Muslims have culture. And mm. so uh, if we live in the UK, we have uh, Muslim, uh, we have UK dress and we have UK uh, culture and so forth. So uh, we need to have uh, appeal to open minded, progressive, liberal Muslims. And there are many of them that need to come on board and to realize that this uh, venomous, vile, uh, uh, manifestation of Islam is imported from backward places like Pakistan, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, you name it, that this, that version of Islam may have some resonance there, 
but it has no relevance in this society. And this is what uh, open-minded, progressive, liberal Muslims should be doing. Now, it's such an important point you raise. There's no part of the Quran that forces women to wear the burqa or that dictates that people must wear beards or, 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 or do whatever. No. And there are many Muslim countries that actually ban the burqa and, uh, and, and many other things like that. But I suppose one of the counter-arguments to what you say is that there are lots of passages within the Quran, as there are within the Torah and the Bible, that are deeply homophobic, that are deeply sexist, that do look at sort of values that might have been uh, more in tune with the world 1,500 years ago than the world today. Yeah, but I think when let's talk about two things, you raise uh, homosexuality and sexism. Let's de first deal with homosexuality. The Quran, like the Bible and the Torah you just mentioned, doesn't approve of homosexuality. But no way in the Quran do they talk about the punishment of homosexuals. So that's very important. Okay, so you can say, listen, I do not agree with same-sex relationships, whatever. And someone should be entitled to say that. Because we live, after all, in a free country. So that's what the Quran is on very clear, that it doesn't approve of it. And a judgment, so to speak, is to be left to God. Come to the issue of sexism. Throughout the Quran, actually, the thrust of the Quran is gender equity and equality between men and women. You mentioned the burqa is not mentioned in the, in the Quran by name, nor the niqab, the face mask, nor the, even the hijab. The hijab in the Quran, the so-called red cover, covering, it's got nothing to do with female's hair. It's got to do with the partition, the barrier, the secluder, divider, separator. That's how the word hijab is used. This, uh, this idea of sexism and misogyny and patriarchy and chauvinism doesn't have any foundation within the Quran itself. It come from culture Ta and it comes from Taj, uh, is, the priest. Do we have a problem with, uh, let's say, self-proclaimed community leaders within the Muslim community who uh, use their position to grandstand and they say they represent the Muslim community, but actually they only represent the fundamentalist Muslims and they have quite an authoritarian view of how one should read the Quran and what they should see in the Quran and how they should behave in their lives. Because we've seen quite shocking footage in the past of um, some imams preaching in mosques in Britain and preaching very let's just say, nasty and sometimes bigoted things, and anti-British things, anti-Western values. How do we put moderate Muslims at the forefront of this conversation, rather than giving platforms to people who are quite extreme, let's be frank? Well, I mean, very bluntly, but this is a, uh, a very brief, rather. This is a, a small in interview here. We need to uh, promote Muslims who are the three eyes, meaning those who are inclusive, those who are integrated and, 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 and quotes, indigenous. In other words, people who are fully part and parcel of this society. So, for example, someone thinks, listen, you must have a big beard, you must have a flowing robe, and that's Islam. That person is actually not conducive to living in this society. If he wants to wear a, a robe or a big beard, whatever, then there's plenty of other places for them to go to Sharia land. We need to promote all the right-thinking, right-minded Muslims who have adjusted to this society. I've come as an image. Immigrant. I still retain an accent, but I'm fully integrated in this society. And this is the kind of people we should be promoting, not people with big fancy beards and think that this is the way to reach the Muslim community. We need something what happened in, in Judaism. In Judaism, especially in the 19th century, you had the titanic struggle between the Orthodox and the Reformers. We haven't had a similar struggle in Muslim society, especially in the UK. We need to have this uh, clear blue line between those fundamentalist, traditionalists, and who are chauvinist and patriarchally minded on one side, and people are progressives and liberals on the other side. Mm -hmm. And then the community can choose, and then mm -hmm. also the wider public, who are not Muslim, will be able to see that there are two distinct or three what, distinct what strands. What a fascinating parallel Islam. between the Orthodox and the Reformers. Uh, what, a, what an interesting point. Dr. Taj Hajay, thank you so much for coming on uh, to GB News. Really appreciate your time and your thoughts. Great to speak to you. Now, Pope Francis has sparked outrage as he says Ukraine should raise the white flag in its fight against Russia. Does he have a point? More on that very soon.
Hello again. Here's your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. Some places towards the east may see a touch of frost, even a few patches of fog tonight. But for many, it is going to turn wet and windy due to an area of low pressure and an associated weather system feeding in from the west. We already have an occluded front across parts of Northern Ireland that has brought some rain earlier today, and that is going to bring more rain to northwest Scotland as we go through this evening and overnight. But it's across Northern Ireland where we're going to see some heavier rain and strong winds pushing in overnight and that rain then later reaching parts of western England, Wales and Scotland as we go through the early hours of tomorrow. Further east and there may be some clear spells in the cloud and so we could see a touch of frost, perhaps even a few patches of fog around first thing. Otherwise as we go through Tuesday a wet start and a windy start across western parts. The heaviest rain will be over higher ground, particularly over the hills and mountains of North Wales. The rain does ease a little bit as it pushes its way eastwards but most places will see some wet and windy weather for a time. We're going to see some milder air pushing its way in, so temperatures lifting a little bit higher than today, highs of around 13 or 14 Celsius. More wet weather to come as we go through the end of the day tomorrow. Whilst the outbreaks of rain do push their way towards the east, there are further outbreaks of rain pushing in from the west, again heaviest over any higher ground. More rain to come as we go through the rest of the week, particularly across northern and western parts, but it is going to turn milder, temperatures widely getting into mid-teens. Bye-bye. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Well, it's 12.49 and Pope Francis has caused outrage for saying Kyiv should raise the white flag and negotiate an end to the war with Russia. Yes, Ukrainian officials have urged the Pope to stand on the side of good, with the country's foreign minister telling the pontiff the Ukrainian flag is a yellow and blue one with which they live, die and prevail. So is this a serious misstep from the Pope? Well, let's pose that question to the associate editor of the Catholic Herald, Dr. Gavin Ashingdon. In your view, has the Pope stuck his foot in, stuck his foot in it this time, or is he saying something that makes sense to you? I think the Pope has done wonderfully well. Uh, he's acting as a Pope should, and I'm very proud of him for doing it. I'm sorry there are so few voices telling the obvious truth in the world. I mean, there are two issues here, aren't there? There's the geopolitical calculations and there are moral ones. Uh, we might come on to the geopolitical calculations in a moment, but the moral ones are quite clear. This appears to be a conflict in which there is a form of deadlock. Lots of people are dying. It would be more sensible to stop and negotiate an end to it instead of allowing so many more young men to die. There is a, a moral hazard here. And I would have thought that the Pope, being someone who engages in moral philosophy on a day-to-day -day basis would think about this moral hazard, which is this. When Russia took Crimea in 2014, the world said negotiate. The world said, do not fight, let's not shed blood. But that didn't end the matter. Just a matter of years later, Putin was back for more and much more blood was shed. Is it not simply going to do the same thing? to say, let's just negotiate, let's have uh, Ukraine raise, in the Pope's word, 
the white flag of surrender, only then to let Russia rearm and no doubt push on further once they've uh, reinforced their lines of defence. Well, what I think you've done is you, you've extrapolated from a geopolitical analysis a moral position. And that would be fine if your geopolitical analysis was correct. I've been following for, since about, nine, nine, uh, about 2015, uh, uh, Dr. Professor Mi uh, um, uh, Mearsheimer, who's a, an American uh, historian. And he's been complaining that from about 2012, when NATO and uh, Europe uh, produced a coup in Ukraine and dislodged a pro-Russian president in favor of pro-Western one, and then began to do exactly what they'd promised not to do after the fall of the war, which was to build Western infrastructure in Ukraine. And Putin then gave, I'm, I'm, I don't mean to be a Putin apologist here, but just these it's are the facts. It's starting to sound a little bit like one. Well, it's just because nobody nobody broadcasts this, and I've been watching quite carefully um, for the last t 10 years, and Putin said to the West, please, it's a bit like the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Americans said to Russia in 1963, if you place Q missiles right next to our borders, we will get extremely upset. And Putin said exactly the same thing to NATO. NATO went on doing it. They, they forgot um, laboratory, chemical laboratories in Ukraine. And finally, Putin said, if you go on doing this, I'm going to, to resist. Now, I don't think Putin should have done it. He's it's been disastrous and murderous, but, but I think. this is gangster. talking about spheres of influence. We don't exist in this sort of 100-year-old parallel where great powers get to control their satellites. If Ukraine wants to be a closer ally of NATO, if Ukraine wants to join NATO, they should be free to do so, whether or not that angers Mr Putin. Of course they should. Absolutely right. Which is why NATO and Europe shouldn't have interfered with, with uh, Ukrainian elections. But leaving, leaving it to one side whose fault it is, um, it is the case there's a deadlock of some kind. That neither side is winning. Uh, and, as, and as it does appear that Ukraine is being used as a proxy for uh, putting pressure on Russia by NATO and Europe. Now, it's not going very well. The Russians aren't doing very well. The Ukrainians aren't doing very well. There's no obvious way in which a deadlock can be breached. Right? Mm. Putin is even disastrously and immorally talking about a nuclear strike, which is But, Gavin, horrific. would it not be appeasement to negotiate on their sovereign territory? I mean, it comes down to that, doesn't it? If you allow Putin to take something, he will then not stop at that point. And I think there's quite a lot of evidence to suggest that's the case. Well, the, the evident the context is that Donetsk, the Russian speakers of Donetsk, have been under bombardment by by Western Ukrainians for the last ten years. So they would say they're not being appeased; they want self-defense and self-determination. Of this course, you many believe, people would argue that that was the Russian proxies fighting there that have been under bombardment, given the sort of uh, subtle invasion that occurred before the full-scale one. Uh, but Dr. Gavin Ashton, I'm afraid we have run out of time. We must have you back because this is a really interesting conversation to have and appreciate. Appreciate your forthright views on this matter and indeed the forthright views of the Pope. Yes, well, that's all for this hour, but stay with us as shortly we'll be discussing whether Lee Anderson should call a by election. This is Good Afternoon Britain. We're on GB News, Britain's news channel. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello again. Here's your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. Some places towards the east may see a touch of frost, even a few patches of fog tonight. But for many, it is going to turn wet and windy due to an area of low pressure and an associated weather system feeding in from the west. We already have an occluded front across parts of Northern Ireland that has brought some rain earlier today, and that is going to bring more rain to northwest Scotland as we go through this evening and overnight. But it's across Northern Ireland where we're going to see some heavier rain and strong winds pushing in overnight and that rain then later reaching parts of western England, Wales and Scotland as we go through the early hours of tomorrow. Further east and there may be some clear spells in the cloud and so we could see a touch of frost, perhaps even a few patches of fog around first thing. Otherwise as we go through Tuesday a wet start and a windy start across western parts. The heaviest rain will be over higher ground, particularly over the hills and mountains of North Wales. The rain does ease a little bit as it pushes its way eastwards but most places will see some wet and windy weather for a time. 
time. We're going to see some milder air pushing its way in, so temperatures lifting a little bit higher than today, highs of around 13 or 14 Celsius. More wet weather to come as we go through the end of the day tomorrow. Whilst the outbreaks of rain do push their way towards the east, there are further outbreaks of rain pushing in from the west, again heaviest over any higher ground. More rain to come as we go through the rest of the week, particularly across northern and western parts, but it is going to turn milder, temperatures widely getting into mid-teens. Bye-bye. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. We've got cash, treats and a spring shopping spree to be won in a great British giveaway. You could win an amazing £12,345 in tax-free cash. Plus, there's a further £500 of shopping vouchers to spend at your favourite store. We'll also give you a gadget package to use in your garden this spring. That includes a games console, a pizza oven and a portable smart speaker so you can listen to GB News on the go. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, Text GB Win to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday, the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's one o'clock on Monday, the 11th of March. Lee joins Nigel Farage. Lee Anderson has dramatically quit the Conservative Party today to join the Reform Party, becoming their first MP. Will other Tories follow? And who's next? Should a by-election be called? And Kate apologises. Princess Catherine issues an official apology over the manipulated photograph of her and her children released on Mothering Sunday. She says she was simply experimenting with editing, but she's now facing calls to release the original. Raise the white flag. A call from Pope Francis to Ukraine in their ongoing conflict with Russia. It sparked outrage between politicians and commentators as the Pope comes under fire for failing to condemn Russia.
Well, we had a bit of a back and forth with uh, Gavin Ashenden there. He said the Pope was quite right, that there should be some kind of negotia negotiation mm. to end this war. Um, but a lot of you don't think that should be the case. Clive from Sheffield says, what does Putin have over the Pope? Would the Pope expect the Papal Guard to raise the white flag if the Vatican were invaded by Putin? No, I don't expect so. Oh, goodness me, the Catholic Church doesn't have the most unblemished history of who they've cooperated with and who they no. haven't. But uh, Ramon uh, has got in touch to say, uh, Hi, Tom and Emily, I've never heard such tosh in my life. Putin got Ukraine to de-arm under the pretense that Russia would never invade. Your guest is totally wrong. We all want peace, but never forget that Putin wants Ukraine. Ukraine should fight on. And Brian in Wolverhampton says, If the Pope wants to an end to the war in Ukraine, he should be telling the dictator Putin to end the war, not Ukraine rolling over. Mm, Strong al point. Although uh, uh, Leon has got in touch saying that uh, the outline of the situation in Ukraine is that NATO have been putting bases on the border and provoking Russia. That's, uh, that's Leon's view, although um, not sure. Not, I think that's a that's a pretty anachronistic way to view oh. world affairs, oh. this sort of spheres of influence idea. Yeah. We no longer have empires and satellite states. Well, and lots of you have been getting in touch to say that you uh, very much appreciated the input from our guest earlier in the hour, Taj Hagi. Mm. Um, he was talking about how it's important for moderate Muslims to stand up towards extremism from within the community, and it can't all be done top down. Um, so, yes, I'd I love to speak to him he, again. It was such an amazing point that... Judaism sort of went through the reform process. You had the Orthodox and the Reform uh, Jewish people, and, and, and from the Victorian era, there was such integration. And that just hasn't happened with the Islamic community, or at least it hasn't happened yet. A big, big opportunity, perhaps. Yes, well, let's get your headlines. Tom, Emily, thank you very much. Good afternoon. The headlines just after one o'clock and we start with the latest developments in our top story of the day. That Lee Anderson has now accused the Conservatives of stifling free speech. That comes after he announced defection to Reform UK, becoming their first MP. Mr Anderson was stripped of the Conservative whip after refusing to apologise for claiming that Islamists had, he said, got control of the London Mayor Sadiq Khan. As recently as January, Mr Anderson had said that Reform was not a proper political party. Now, Reform's newest member, he said his new party would allow him to speak out on behalf of millions of British voters. Parliament doesn't seem to understand what many British people want. And quite frankly, some of them need to get out more. I made some remarks a few weeks back about the London Mayor, for which I was stripped of the whip in the, from the Conservative Party. And let me be clear, right now, on this stage, I will not apologise. It is no secret that I've been talking to my friends in Reform for a while, and Reform UK has offered me the chance to speak out in Parliament on behalf of millions of people up and down the country who feel that they're not being listened to. Other news making the headlines today. The Princess of Wales has publicly apologised for an altered family photo released by Kensington Palace. Posting to social media earlier, she admitted that, like many amateur photographers, she occasionally experiments with editing and added that she was sorry for any confusion it may have caused. The Mother's Day image was taken by the Prince of Wales and was withdrawn by various global photo agencies after suspicions had arisen that a number of edits may have been made. Nottinghamshire Police has been told by a watchdog that it must urgently produce an improvement plan after it was put into special measures. The families of Barnaby Webber and Grace O'Malley Kumar have welcomed that news. The two teenagers and school caretaker Ian Coates died during a spate of knife attacks in Nottingham. The force there has been asked to improve how it manages and carries out effective investigations and to put measures in place that ensure victims get the support that they need. Three former Conservative Home Secretaries are calling for a united front to tackle extremism from Islamists and far-right groups. In a joint statement, Dame Priti Patel, Sir Sajid Javid and Amber Rudd are urging both Labour and the Conservatives to work together to understand and combat the issue. It comes as Community Secretary Michael Gove is preparing to announce a new government definition of extremism. Meanwhile, more than 50 victims of Islamist terror attacks have signed a separate letter condemning anti-Muslim hate, saying it's important to separate extremists from the majority of British Muslims. 
The energy regulator Ofgem is looking at ways to protect consumers from spiralling costs amid a record number of unpaid bills. Around £3.1 billion of debts are piling up as concerns grow over the cost of household bills. It's after the price of energy in an average British home hit more than £3,500 last year in October. A major police operation is underway at a funeral director's after concerns were raised about how the dead were being treated there. We understand there's a large number of officers in and around the area where those three branches of funeral homes are in Hull and in East Yorkshire, including forensics officers and a maritime protection unit. Police have also said around 350 people have now contacted them about their ongoing investigation into those branches of legacy independent funeral directors. It comes after a 46-year-old man and a 23-year-old woman were arrested on suspicion of preventing a lawful and decent burial. We've also heard that 34 bodies have now been respectfully transported to a mortuary for formal identification. In other royal news today, the Queen is leading the royal family at this year's Commonwealth Day service as the King continues his cancer treatment. Her Majesty, accompanied by the Prince of Wales and other key members, are gathering at Westminster Abbey for the annual celebration. This year's event draws on the theme of resilience against a backdrop of health worries in the royal family. And though he'll miss today's service, the King echoed his late mother in a video message, reaffirming his commitment to serve the 56 member countries, he says, to the best of his ability. And finally to the US, where last night's Oscars were dominated by nuclear bomb epic Oppenheimer, winning seven awards, including Best Director for Christopher Nolan. And here's the moment that Killian Murphy claimed Best Actor. We made a film about the, the man who created the atomic bomb and for better or for worse, we're all living in Oppenheimer's world, so I would really like to dedicate this to the peacemakers everywhere. Another of the biggest cheers of the night went to Emma Stone, who took home her second award for Best Actress, this time for the black comedy Poor Things. But it was a night of bad luck for songwriting legend Diane Warren. The writer of 33 top 10 singles has notched up 15 nominations so far, but sadly with zero wins. Last night's award for Best Original Song instead went to Billie Eilish and Phineas O'Connell for the track What Was I Made For, which was featured in the hit Barbie movie. Those are the headlines. For more, you can sign up to GB News Alerts. Just scan the QR code there on your screen. Or if you're listening on radio, go to gbnews.com alerts. For now, though, it's back to Tom and Emily. Well, Lee Anderson has sensationally defected from the Conservative Party to Reform UK, becoming the party's first Member of Parliament. Yes, the move shocked Westminster, but it may not come as quite the surprise to some of you. He's been in talks with Reform for quite a while. He ended his speech by declaring, I want my country back. However, his decision has unsurprisingly sparked much criticism from the Conservative Party, with Home Secretary James Cleverley describing Lee Anderson's defection as a mistake. Well, to discuss this further, we are joined by GB News political editor Christopher Hope. Christopher, thank you very much for joining us. I note just uh, that the new Conservatives group, which is headed up by Miriam Cates MP and Danny Kruger, have said uh, the responsibility lies with the Conservative Party itself. That's right. And hi, uh, hello, Tom. Hi, Emily. That's right. So the, the new Conservative group run by Danny Kruger and Miriam Cates, they're making very clear they regret Lee Anderson's choice to leave the party. It makes the Labour government more likely. I mean, literally, of course, it reduces the party's majority in the House of Commons uh, f f uh, permanently with him joining that party. But also they feel, those two and this group of new Conservatives, that it's time to go back to that, uh, the, the, the kind of radicalness of 2019 and, and, and offer more obvious right-wing policy to, to win back the support in the polls. The reaction in Westminster has been quite interesting. Lots of uh, fury with Lee Anderson. I was struck by Dame Jackie 
Doyle's Price's response to the revelation on GB News when I interviewed Lee Anderson about two hours ago. I said, when did you tell the PM? He said, I haven't yet. So the PM would have found out maybe through watching our coverage on GB News. That prompted Dame Jackie Doyle Price, the MP for Thorough, to say he's a big girl's blouse. So there's lots of um, fruity language in Westminster today. He was thrown off the MP's um, uh, WhatsApp group for the Home Office uh, earlier. Um, And uh, where does it go from here? Well, we might see as many as nine other Tory MPs uh, joining reform. That's the figure I've been given by um, people in the Reform Party or close to the Reform Party. I asked, we asked that of Richard Tice. He said he suggested that Labour MPs could join. He said unless there's an early election on May the 2nd, there'll be more defections. So that, that, that is where it's going next. Lee Anderson himself has talked to no other Tory MPs, he tells me. But it goes back to that revelation we gave uh, our viewers uh, just, over, just over two weeks ago when we revealed that, of course, Lee Anderson met with Richard Tice on a service station at the M1. And that's what started these talks, ended right now in Westminster today, with what is an embarrassing defection for, for PM Rishi Sunak. The man defined as the red wall made flesh has now left the Tory party. No, really, really big news. And it comes as perhaps a surprise, given it was not so long ago, at the start of this year, on this very channel, that Lee Anderson himself gave a passionate defence of why people should stick with the Tories. Let's have a listen. Um, Or a threat. They are a threat, a bigger threat to the country at the moment, I think, than the Labour Party, because if reform do pick off a lot of us... Conservative MPs at the next election, then what's going to happen is we're going to end up with a, with a Labour government. And a Labour government is the last thing I want. I love my country. I love my country to bits. I don't want to see a Labour government. A bigger threat from the Labour Party. That's how uh, Lee Anderson branded uh, Reform UK. That was in January. That's right. I was trying to find my, in my notes there. In that interview on, on June the second, he did say there, didn't, didn't he, that the reform was not the answer. It was just let, letting Keir Starmer in. I asked him that question in my in my question at the press conference. Uh, what's changed in the past ten weeks since since uh, uh, January the second? He said George Galloway. He said the the by election. Uh, win by George Galloway, which pushed the Tories into third place. The Labour candidate, although the one that was disowned by the party, into fourth place, he said that the winner for George Galloway was the moment when he felt it's time to move on and change party. I asked Richard Tice, and Richard Tice said that he said that it was the, the following day when Tice talked about the country being plunged into recession. That's what changed the dial on talks with MPs. But certainly for, for the MP, the Reform UK MP, Lee Anderson, mm. it was that the George Galloway by-election win which caused this. Well, thank you very much indeed, Chris Hope there, our political editor. Right, let's get the views now of pollster at Opinion, James Crouch. Uh, James, let's take a... Thank you for joining us. Let's take a little zoom out and have a look at uh, Lee Anderson's constituency in Ashfield. What kind of majority did he have and could he win again on a reform ticket? Well, he has a really unusual seat because actually the uh, the second per- second place candidate in Ashfield last time was actually an independent uh, and... It's, it's incredibly difficult to work out what his majority might be on the new boundaries. But the, the, the challenge here is, is much wider than that, which is Lee Anderson might be jumping on a trend, but it's quite unclear to see how that continues uh, from here. Like, reform are already at 11 points, uh, which is the highest that we've seen them. Um, but it does appear that they are almost hitting a ceiling. And the real question is, while uh, Lee Anderson might be doing a really good job at hitting some headlines here. How do they keep that momentum up from here? There still could be many months to a general election. So that's the big question. James, are there parallels here with UKIP? Back in 2014, they scored a sensational defection of Douglas Carswell, the then Conservative MP for Clacton, switched across to UKIP uh, and really caught the wind of the sails. It was during the summer when there wasn't much political news. Everyone was talking about it. Uh, And then he fought a by-election, which kept it in the news, but also gave this sense that the party was winning and could win Westminster elections. I suppose that's where the parallels with Reform UK end, at least when it comes to a by-election. Well, yes, there is a big question about whether he will stand in a by-election, because he's previously said that people that change party should do. And I, I think the, the question here 
does become what can reform do that almost increases their electoral ceiling. So at the moment, yes, there are 11 points. It might go up to 12, maybe even 13. Um, but that really is hitting the ceiling. Almost everyone on our polling who says they might consider voting for reform already says they are. And the Conservatives will probably play a pretty good game uh, throwing Anderson's comments right back at him, as uh, we've already seen just on this program, uh, that, you know, there's a fear of letting Labour in. Mm. Now, so if there are a few more MPs, that does actually string it out, but you could still get to a, a short campaign without that, you know, a short campaign and see the Conservatives winning some of those voters back. However, that does have to be said that's at present. So mm. there could be something that comes along that actually boosts that electoral ceiling. The question is, what precisely is it? Yes, very interesting. And of course, uh, Lee Anderson says he speaks for millions of people up and down the country. Whether that translates to votes is quite another. Of course, the Conservatives are very much pushing and sticking to the argument that a vote for reform is a vote for the Labour Party, which is true under our electoral system, is it not? Well, at present it is. I think one of the reasons why they are still hitting 12% if they're, if they're lucky, rather than near a kind of a fifth, which UKIP got uh, in 2015, is because the Labour Party is still doing so well. We must remember back in 2015, the Conservative uh, UKIP didn't just eat into the Conservative vote, it ate into the Labour vote, which is why the ultimate outcome you got was actually David Cameron still staying in office. So while they might be doing a really good job at appealing to a lot of disgruntled Conservatives, they've kind of reached that limit, um, at least it suggests they might have, and are they willing to reach out to say something that might appeal to some Labour voters? Bear in mind, the Conservatives have lost just as many voters to Labour as they have done to reform, or at least they are at the moment, um, and they all voted for Boris Johnson's 2019 platform. So can they appeal to those voters too? That's the thing that really gets them further along than, than where we are. Big questions for Reform UK. Well, for now, James Crouch, pollster at Opinion, thank you very much for your time. Well, in other news, the Princess of Wales has apologised for the confusion over a Mothering Sunday photo released by Kensington Palace yesterday. In a statement released on social media, the Princess said, like many amateur photographers, I do occasionally experiment with editing. Right, well, Kensington Palace said it would not be reissuing the original unedited photograph, but it's true to say that lots of people are actually demanding mm. that she reveal the unedited photograph. Would that end the speculation, though? Well, GB News Royal Correspondent Cameron Walker joins us from Westminster Abbey, uh, where there is a Commonwealth Day service due to take place soon. But, Cameron, on this photograph, what a monumental kerfuddle. Absolutely, Tom. It is a bit of a PR disaster for Kensington Palace. It appears to be a bit of an innocent mistake from the Princess of Wales on the surface. She admits that she uh, edited parts of that photograph, saying that she is an amateur photographer and occasionally experiments with editing. But the problem is this isn't an ordinary photograph. This is a photograph which was intended to reassure the public that she is, in fact, doing well and quashing all those online conspiracy theories. Instead, what it's done is added fuel to the fire. It appears that Kensington Palace uh, did not thoroughly check the image which was given to, from the Princess of Wales to them before uh, distributing it to the press, which meant that four international agencies uh, got, uh, pulled the image from their servers. Of course, they've got their own reputation to uphold because news organisations expect uh, trust trustworthy images to be distributed to them. Same with the Press Association here in the United Kingdom. They have also pulled the image. And it raises the wider point that if the Prince and Princess of Wales insist on privacy, insist on, let's say, controlling the photographs that they release of them and their children, uh, the fact they don't have an independent news photographer there has now created a lot of questions for them and whether it is appropriate for that to continue. But as you said, Tom, uh, those, uh, the, the Kensington Palace is not releasing the original image. But earlier, you may have noticed, actually, there's a lot of noise going on behind me from various different protest groups. One of those protest groups is the anti-monarchy campaign group Republic. I spoke to the CEO a little bit later, uh, a little bit earlier on, Graeme Smith, and this is his reaction to the Princess of Wales's apology. I mean, it, 
it doesn't really explain anything. We could see it's been edited. Um, the question is why? Uh, and why haven't they shown us the original photo? Um, because it's, it's not just edited in a way that, you know, she's trying to tidy it up. It looks uh, photoshopped in a way that, you know, were those people all in the photo when it was taken? Um, that's what it looks like. I'm not saying they weren't or were, but it just, it's very odd, and I don't think people are going to be convinced. Well, later today, the Prince of Wales, the Queen and other members of the royal family will be at the Commonwealth Day service at Westminster Abbey for 75th anniversary. The King is absent because he is continuing his cancer treatment but has released a video message which will be played at the service. Well, we'll be looking out for Prince William, of course, uh, arriving just a little later on. Thank you very much, Cameron Walker. I should say there are lots of placards behind Cameron there with the down... What was it? Down with the King, Down not with the crown. King. Down, down with, with the, the crown. Down with the crown. And not my king, which is just factually incorrect. He is your king. If you're British, he's your king. You might not like him, but he is your Did king. Did you ever go have a little uh, Republican, you know, time? Um, I thought nine? about Mitt Romney for a time. No, face. I'm joking. I'm joking. Face. <laughs> a, a Republican face. <laughs> that was, that face. was a US politics joke. Um, <laughs> okay, it was a really bad joke. But coming up, I didn't uh, get it. has the <laughs> Republican. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, but uh, but uh, Lee Anderson, of course, defecting to reform. We're going to be asking: Is it time for him to call a by-election? Big debate on this very shortly. Mark Dolan tonight. Weekends from 9 p.m. Uh, Kinsey, great to have you back on the show. Now, listen, you, uh, we're, not, well, we're not slated to talk about the Prince Harry story, but um, I've kind of surprised a few people by suggesting that I think he should have armed royal protection when he's in Britain. What do you think? Well, they aren't my tax dollars that are paying for Prince Harry's protection, but I agree with you. I think that he should feel safe and he should feel safe to bring his family back to see his father, if that's the case. Well, his stepmother, uh, Kinsey, Queen Camilla gets a well-deserved break. Tell me more. That's right. Queen Camilla has no engagements on her agenda this week, with the Times reporting that she will spend a few days of downtime with the king. Camilla has been working overtime to support the monarchy just last last month she repeatedly drove over six hours to a royal engagement after her flight was grounded because she reportedly did not want to let down her husband she will resume engagements on march 11th representing the king and leading the royal family for the commonwealth day service at westminster abbey a source told the times although she was not expecting to find herself in the position of leading the family the queen is absolutely prepared to do whatever needs to be done for the institution and can i just say speaking of harry i think the fact that Queen Camilla is seen as leading the family is significant proof that Prince Harry would not return to mm. temporarily support the family because Camilla's elevated position is likely not something sitting well with him right now. He loved Queen Elizabeth II. He likely resents the idea of Queen Camilla. And we know um, that that's a position he felt like his mother should be in. Most definitely. He was very nasty about Queen Camilla in his book Spare. <laughs> He was. So I imagine that the idea of her leading the family is something he has a hard time digesting. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panelists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. It's 1.25, you're watching and listening to Good Afternoon Britain. Now Lee Anderson has become Reform UK's first MP. 
It's a move that has shaken Westminster, with the former Conservative Party vice chairman and MP for Ashfield confirming that he's been in talks with reform for a while, declaring, I want my country back. But it sparked this question. Should Lee Anderson call for a by-election in his seat? He could do so tomorrow. Joining us to this in the studio to discuss this are our very own presenters, Albie Amancona and Darren Grimes. Let's uh, kick off with you, Albie. You're saying that he should call a by-election. Why? Yes, I think he absolutely should call a by-election. I mean, I think you're being a bit generous saying it's sh shaken Westminster. I think everyone saw this a mile off after he lost the Tory whip and refused to apologise for saying that Sadiq Khan was controlled by Islamists. Look, he should call a by-election for the very simple reason that he agreed to a backbench bill back in 2020, where essentially the bill was proposing that all MPs who defected to another political party that that a recall petition and a by-election would automatically be called. And because of the way this is recorded in Hansard, and Lee's surname is Anderson, his name appears right at the top of the bill underneath Diane Abbott. It's there memorialised in history for all of us to see Lee's hypocrisy. So if he doesn't call a by-election, not only is he going to look like a complete turncoat, having defected from Labour to the Conservatives to reform, he's going to look like a hypocrite too. Darren, a hypocrite if he doesn't? Absolutely not. Look, this is more Westminster drivel, right, where people like Albie are wanting the taxpayer to front up hundreds of thousands of pounds on a by-election when we have a general election mere months away. I think it would be absolutely ludicrous. I think Lee is absolutely right to say so. Look, ultimately, if you ask me, the 2019 prospectus, that coalition that was built by Boris Johnson, it doesn't exist anymore. That party that I and others voted for in red wall seats such as my own, such as Ashfield even, that doesn't exist anymore. That party is moving in a more David Cameron Cameron direction, not a more Lee Anderson direction. So I think he's absolutely right to stand up and say, look, I haven't left the Conservative Party, the Conservative Party's left me. And if he feels more comfortable in reform, then fair enough to him. But you do not call a by-election when we are months away from a general So why election. did he sign a bill saying that by-elections should be called when MPs defect from political parties just four years ago, Darren? That is hypocritical, is it not? I think that would hold water, that argument would hold water, were we years away from a general election. But we are not. We are months away. I don't understand why you want to waste hundreds of thousands of hard-earned taxpayer cash on this Westminster freak show. Because I think it's a it matter would be of absurd. principle, Darren. Lee, can... Lee spoke this morning it's about not... the reason why he defected was because he was a man of principle, country first, then party, um, and, and then I can't remember what the last point was. He said he was doing it on principled reasons. This, this is unprincipled for him to say. It's not about principle for you. It's unprincipled for him to say that he is not going to call a by-election when actually four years ago he signed a bill and short to make any MP that did what he has done call a by-election. He's well, not Albie, living by there, his own word. Is there a slight difference here, though? Because of course he had the whip taken away from him. He yeah. had the Conservative whip taken away from him. He no longer belonged to a party. So it's not quite a defection in the uh, in the usual way, is it, Albie? Mm. Emily, did he not move from the Conservative Party? To Reform Party over the last few weeks? Well, he had the whip suspended, which yeah. hastened the decision, I imagine. Look, I think most people at home would see what Lee has done over the past couple of weeks as a defection. He's moved from one party to another party. All right, there was some time in between when he was an independent, but it was obvious that he was always going to join the Reform Party, and today he has. And he signed a bill, a backbench bill, in 2020 saying that MPs who defect political parties and cross the aisle whilst they're sitting in Parliament should call a by-election, and that's that is why Lee Anderson needs to call one, otherwise he's a hypocrite. I don't think that's right at all. I imagine the inbox right now, GB Views, will be filling up saying, actually, Albie, I think you're completely wrong. I think it would be ludicrous to want to bring about a media freak show only because you're disinterested in Lee Anderson's politics. I'm sorry that the Conservative Party is, is less Lee Anderson and more Albie Amancona, because I think that's all the poorer for red wall seats such as that as Ashfield. I've always liked Lee, Darren. Look, we're 
disagree on some things politically, much like you and I disagree with each other on much things politically, but I like you. This is not about personalities. This is about principle. In 2020, Lee Anderson signed a backbench Yeah, you could bill keep saying that, but saying, that doesn't get away from true. the fact that you're it's true. So, so, if so you, you think it's necessary saying, to spend hundreds you of thousands of pounds. Darren, they're also is saying there Lee an is argument? wrong. Darren, is there an argument that perhaps he wouldn't be able to win on a reform he won't. party ticket? So therefore, it's, you know, time wasting. Look, I think you could do very, very well in a by-election, actually. It's I a think, cool one. Well, because I don't think there is any point months away from a general uh, election. Grimes, You're going to get your case, chance. Wasn't it the case that in November 2014, uh, Mark Reckless, defecting from the Conservatives to UKIP, yep. called a by-election for his defection in Rochester and Strood. That was just five months before the 2015 general election. We're eight to nine months away from this year's general election if it's in November, as many political commentators expect. Why should there have been a by-election in Rochester and Strood, but not... Now, well, some people are saying actually the general election could be as early as May, right? So uh, goodness only knows when it's going to be. You know, you'd have to be Mystic Meg to be able to read Rishi Sunak's mind. He can't make any political decisions that seem to be lasting. Do you want good. to answer Tom's question? Yes, then? absolutely. I, I, I don't think actually the the with being months away compared to with being an entire year away, again, is a different proposition. I think Lee Anderson was right to sign that bill, and I personally, watching all of these, the likes of Anna Subri and all the rest of it defect from the, the party to the Change UK or whatever it was called, it was ridiculous, it was farcical. So back then, I think it made sense, years away from any election or the prospect of five months away one. from an election. Five months away from an election right now. It's, well, it's not if it's in May. Well, on that note, good debate. Thank you very much indeed, as always. Darren Grimes and Albie Amancona. Um, you can see them on Saturday, Saturday, on the Saturday Five, this Saturday, of course. Well, that was good. Yes, both no, sides, interesting well points, put. Interesting points. I do think, I do think there, is, there is that fundamental point of consistency, though, isn't there? I don't know. I mean, I think it's tricky with what's happened with the Conservative Party and his relationship with them. Certainly. I'm not sure if it's a traditional affection. Although, although I have to say, if, if you think there's going to be an election in May, I've got a bridge to sell you. Well, there might be. GBVs at GBnews.com. Whose side are you on? Albie Amanconas or Darren Grimes? Well, in other news, Dartford locals are outraged as a residential building is reportedly to be used to house asylum seekers. More on that exclusive story after your headlines with Sam. Tom, Emily, thank you very much. Good afternoon from the newsroom 133. And uh, a recap of the news we've just been hearing there, that Lee Anderson has now accused the Conservatives of stifling free speech as he announced his defection to the Reform UK party, becoming their first MP. Mr Anderson was stripped of the Conservative whip after refusing to apologise for claiming that Islamists had got control of the London Mayor, Sadiq Khan. Polls suggest that around 13% of voters support reform, and as recently as January, Mr Anderson had said that it was not a proper political party. But now, as Reform's newest member, he says the party will, will allow him to speak out on behalf of millions. Parliament doesn't seem to understand what many British people want. And quite frankly, some of them need to get out more. I made some remarks a few weeks back about the London Mayor, for which I was stripped of the whip in the, from the Conservative Party. And let me be clear, right now, on this stage, I will not apologise. It is no secret that I've been talking to my friends in Reform for a while and Reform UK has offered me the chance to speak out in Parliament on behalf of millions of people up and down the country who feel that they're not being listened to. You may have seen the family photo of the Princess of Wales. Well, she has now apologised for that altered image released by Kensington Palace. Posting to social media, she admitted that, like many amateur photographers, she occasionally experiments with editing, adding that she was sorry for any confusion that it may have caused. The families of Barnaby Webber and Grace O'Malley Kumar have welcomed news today that Nottinghamshire Police has been put into special measures. The two teenagers and a school caretaker, Ian Coates, died during a spate of knife attacks in Nottingham. The force there has been told by a watchdog that it must urgently produce an improvement plan amid concerns over how it carries out investigations. 
And the energy regulator Ofgem, Ofgem is looking at ways to protect consumers from spiralling costs amid a record number of unpaid bills. Around £3.1 billion of debts are piling up as concerns grow over the high cost of household bills. It comes as the price of energy in an average British home hit more than £3,500 a year last October. Those are the headlines. For more, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the code on your screen or visit our website, gbnews.com alerts. For a valuable legacy your family can own, gold coins will always shine bright. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. And here's your look at the markets this afternoon. The pound will buy you $1.2828 and €1.1739. The price of gold is currently £1,698.37 per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is at 7,632 points. Rosalind Gold proudly sponsors the GB News Financial Report. Hello again. Here's your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. Some places towards the east may see a touch of frost, even a few patches of fog tonight. But for many, it is going to turn wet and windy due to an area of low pressure and an associated weather system feeding in from the west. We already have an occluded front across parts of Northern Ireland that has brought some rain earlier today, and that is going to bring more rain to northwest Scotland as we go through this evening and overnight. But it's across Northern Ireland where we're going to see some heavier rain and strong winds pushing in overnight and that rain then later reaching parts of western England, Wales and Scotland as we go through the early hours of tomorrow. Further east and there may be some clear spells in the cloud and so we could see a touch of frost, perhaps even a few patches of fog around first thing. Otherwise as we go through Tuesday a wet start and a windy start across western parts. The heaviest rain will be over higher ground, particularly over the hills and mountains of North Wales. The rain does ease a little bit as it pushes its way eastwards but most places will see some wet and windy weather for a time. We're going to see some milder air pushing its way in, so temperatures lifting a little bit higher than today, highs of around 13 or 14 Celsius. More wet weather to come as we go through the end of the day tomorrow. Whilst the outbreaks of rain do push their way towards the east, there are further outbreaks of rain pushing in from the west, again heaviest over any higher ground. More rain to come as we go through the rest of the week, particularly across northern and western parts, but it is going to turn milder, temperatures widely getting into mid-teens. Bye-bye. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Right, it's 1.39, you're watching and listening to Good Afternoon Britain. So let's move straight on to an exclusive story for GB News. Locals in Dartford have expressed their horror after a decision has been made to repurpose a building on a residential street to house asylum seekers. The building is being redeveloped to house unaccompanied asylum-seeking children arriving in Kent. There are reports that many locals are furious for not being consulted before works on the site started. According to residents, the site is, has been under construction now for many months. 
Well, joining us now to discuss this is our investigations reporter, Charlie Peters. Charlie, is the issue here that the local community just did not know anything about this before it actually happened? No consultation, no nothing. That's right, and uh, as you just heard, the works had started back in October now, so many months into this process before it was revealed that this building, the Limes in Dartford in Kent, was being redeveloped to house asylum-seeking children. But there's also an additional concern here, which is that this building has a covenant placed upon it from 1964, which was agreed between the NHS and Kent County Council to say that the building would only be used for elderly people as an old people's home. And they say, locals have told GB News, that this restrictive covenant has not been respected as part of this new plan to rehouse unaccompanied asylum-seeking children at the building. Kent County Council, for their part, has told GB News that the covenant will be updated before the repurposing is complete and the building opens for asylum-seeking children. They say that their legal team is in discussion with the NHS to achieve that. But this, uh, this restriction was only revealed when locals got in touch with GB News and shared it with us. Now, Kent is making this move after they lost a High Court uh, ruling last July, which said that they had to make every possible step to house asylum-seeking children within the county. This comes as part of the government's plan, of course, to take people out of those hotels. We've had 118,000 people crossing on small boats since 2018. The Labour Party said last month that there are now some 46,000 people still in hotels. So Kent is going to be one of the many places where these temporary accommodation sites are going to be used. We then expect people to be moved around the country as part of the national transfer scheme while their claims are assessed. But what to do with children is more difficult, of course, especially those that are unaccompanied. Kent have told me just in the last 10 minutes, in fact, that they're going to have round-the-clock supervision and security at the site and also a curfew on the location, social workers assigned to every single child and that they will be no older than 18. They've also said that there are nine further sites in the county that have been identified for redevelopment, but they won't say where they are, citing security risks. Charlie, this is a boarded-up abandoned building, why shouldn't the council repurpose it, breathe some life mm. into it, and house some of the most vulnerable people in the country? Mm. Well, the opposition from the locals is that they weren't asked. They weren't told. There was no consultation whatsoever. Well, Kent are telling me today that as part of the process that they are actively communicating with each local community for the remaining reception centres. But in order to protect their safety of the children and indeed the local communities and the staff against criminal acts, trafficking and exploitation, they're not able to disclose where those remaining sites could be. They could, they could be coming soon to a street near you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Charlie Peters, our investigations reporter. This is the problem. Yes, he says, so this building was not being used for mm. anything else, but there was this covenant on it that if it were to be used, it should be used exclusively for older people, mm. care home or whatever else. Uh, but the problem is no, no conversation with the local people. You have to, when you're doing something like this, surely have some kind of consultation. Well, it depends who owns it. But it's obviously owned by the, by the council, right? Abandoned building. The council needs to house children. These, these, aren't, these aren't people in their 20s or 30s. These are children. So uh, why, do you think the, why do you think all these locals are furious? It's because there's been a lack of consultation. You've got to have I consultation. Think, I, think if there, I think if there was a consultation, people would still be angry. Hmm. Maybe. Maybe. Let us know what you think. GBviews at gbnews.com. But, yes, it wasn't being used for anything else No. At um, that well, time. actually, here's what the locals should do. Here's, here's how I'd get behind the locals. Go on. They yeah. should redevelop... They should submit a proposal to the council saying, you know what, you will have our consent if you turn this into housing. Mm -hmm. let's, turn, let's turn this into housing, uh, perhaps social housing. Uh, and and we'll, here's a plan that we'll completely approve of. Or let's turn it into a local pub and we promise we'll run it as a community and we'll go there. You know, do something... Don't just leave an abandoned building there. 
Yes, I think people are just fed up of the government and their uh, immigration and asylum policy, to be honest. It's so much bigger than this. But it's right. interesting to see the local case studies. Anyway, the Pope Francis has sparked outrage as he says Ukraine should raise the white flag in its fight against Russia. But does he have a point? Can you see a point? More on that very soon. Dubes & Co. Weekdays from 6pm. Get this right, we all know by now, don't we, that so many uh, NHS workers are abused by people that they're trying to help. We'll all agree that that is pretty damn disgraceful, but what do we do about it? Because now uh, some London hospitals are looking at whether or not they should be able to ban people that do this for a year from those hospital facilities. Is that the way forward? Daniel, do you like this? No abuse, no excuse, that is the campaign? There's no other choice for most people. It's either the NHS or nothing. And if you're going to take that monopolistic power, then, then you need, I think, you have responsibilities towards people. You can't cut them off. So there are ways in which, of course, oh. you can bring criminal charges against them. Uh, if they've committed a criminal offence, that's fine. They might even be locked up in jail. But what you can't do is cut off health services because you're the only supplier. Well, yes, Peter? I think you can cut it off and you should cut it off. London is very different from everywhere else, and it goes back to our conversation about immigration. The majority of nurses in London are either African or Filipino, and it harks back to their nature and their culture. When you're younger, your parents look after you. When you're older, you look after them. They don't go into homes. So there's a way that a threshold of tolerance they have that is above and beyond most people. So, because I found, like, when I was younger, most of the nurses were white. Now they work in hospitals in Ascot and Somerset. London is the war zone. I have seen horrific things happen to nurses, and they stay, they show up for work. There's a protection they are owed, beyond owed. And if you abuse, if you abuse something that's offered to you as a part of your citizenship, you should be, there should be a penalty for that. Oh, for the same reason, you. if you're you obliged to use it. There's no offer involved in and, the NHS. But it is, no, but there is an offer, because at there the end of the day, like, obligation. you earn it, you figure out how to get money and go private. So just because you've created something right, that so gives that's you the no, solution. no, it's easy. If you it's see, that's easy, an impossible solution they've created something people. that's kind and easy and beneficial to all, indeed. But it's a good thing for all. Do not abuse it. That simple. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome back. It's 1.48. You're watching and listening to Good Afternoon Britain. Now, lots of you have been getting in touch after that debate we had on whether uh, Lee Anderson should call a by-election, seeing as he's defected to the Reform Party. Pauline says, no by-election, please. We are far too close to the general election, she says. Christian Wakeford defected from the Tories to Labour without a by-election in 2022. That's true, but Christian Wakeford didn't say that there should be by-elections when there are defections. Uh... It does seem like a bit of inconsistency. Kathleen says a by-election at this moment in time would be a complete waste of money. That's Kathleen's view. Uh, yeah. But Martin says the best move a man can make, Lee Anderson to Reform UK. I believe this is a prediction I made in an email months ago. No to a by-election. Martin, it's all down to you. Well, this is the thing. It may have uh, shaken Westminster, but you were uh, eagle-eyed watchers. Mm. Uh, thought he might. Uh, David says, Lee Anderson did not defect. He was kicked out. He is the representative of his constituency. He's entitled to align himself with a political bloc consistent with the values he held when he was elected. The Conservatives have deviated from their election position. Not Lee. I'm sure a lot of people would agree with you there. Yeah, it seems the inbox is pretty on the, f on the side of Lee Anderson and not calling a by-election, but 
Remember back to 2014 when UKIP called those two by-elections? It added to their momentum. It helps them. You yeah, know, if they win. If, oh, well, I suppose that's, if the, they win. that's the point, isn't it? <laughs> Reform probably doesn't think it can win. Well, oh, well. Who knows? Is that the reason? Let us know. In other news, Pope Francis has caused outrage for saying Kyiv should raise the white flag and negotiate an end to the war with Russia. Yes, Ukrainian officials have responded by urging the pontiff to stand on the side of good, with the country's foreign minister telling the Pope that the Ukrainian flag is yellow and blue, by which they live, die and prevail not the white flag of surrender. So is this a serious misstep from the Pope? Joining us now from Kyiv is Ukrainian MP Kira Rudik. Uh, Kira, thank you very much for joining us. Were you surprised to hear this from the Pope? Hello, Tom. Hello, Emily. Thank you so much for having me. Well, uh, we, of course, were very surprised and we took it very painfully, this statement from Pope Francis. Uh, it is not the first time when there was an expression of total un not understanding of what is going on. Uh, the previous ones were the comments about great Russian culture and beforehand an attempt to have a Ukrainian and a Russian to hold the cross together um, at some of the walks um, uh, to, towards the church and they did not um, receive any acceptance here in Ukraine. I totally support the statement of our foreign minister saying that our flag is not white. It is blue and yellow and you can see it behind my back and uh, this is the flag that so many people already sacrificed their lives for because we are fighting for the right thing. I have a really a simple question. Why does Pope Francis not addressing Putin about stopping the war and Russian soldiers about stopping the war crimes that they are committed, uh, committing every single day here in Ukraine? Why he is not addressing Putin on returning of 19,000 Ukrainian kids that have been kidnapped and it has been confirmed? So, and, and instead he is uh, talking uh, about Ukraine raising white flag, which is completely absurd. Look Kira, at religion Kira and... is, he, is he perhaps reflecting a, a general sense of fatigue among some people in the West, um, of course, supporting Ukraine's right um, to, well, to fight Russia and to uh, keep their, their, their territorial integrity? However, huge numbers of people have perished. Huge numbers continue to die, put their lives at risk. And is there an issue here that there hasn't been enough progress and so, I guess from his perspective, he wants, he wants fewer people to die. And so he thinks some kind of negotiation is the answer for that reason. Emily, the stopping of the war would be very simple if Russia stops it and pulls their troops back. But uh, why then, uh, as the victims are being addressed? It's like addressing the victim of rape, like stop pushing, stop pressing, just uh, uh, throw the white flag in this case. It is absurd and it really feels really painful. And most of all, if we fail, if we throw the white flag, which we do not plan to do, the Europe would feel that. Uh, do you think that Putin will stop by himself? You have already heard him. You have seen him painting the maps where Russia takes over the Europe. And we totally believe that because uh, it was Russia's plan uh, from the very beginning. So right now, for the country and for the people who are stopping the horde that is going to try and destroy the democracy as it is, is completely and absolutely unfair. Kira, do you think the Pope was speaking out of ignorance of the situation, or do you think that this is a pope who too often sides with demagogues and dictators, and a pope who perhaps is more comfortable in the palatial uh, setting of, of, of Moscow than he is in the democratic centres of the world? You see, Tom, I didn't get a chance to listen to the whole interview and get like more general feeling because right now we are talking only about um, a short phrase and not about his uh, general uh, attendance, his general uh, view of the situation. We have uh, um, had the Ukrainian delegations meeting uh, him and presenting um, uh, the, all the stories and all the facts about the situation. So he should be aware of what's going on. Perhaps it feels like a simpler solution. And you know, when your life is at stake, it's so painful to be a simpler solution for someone. Mm. 
I want to assure you that Ukraine here continues to fight. We continue fighting under our flag, and we have no ideas or no attempts for the retreats. Thank you very much indeed for your time, Kira Rudik, a Ukrainian MP, of course. Well, you know what side I'm on. Yeah, is that is that uh, the the Pope's? No, I'm joking. <laughs> it's uh, not in this I, case. I, honestly, when I heard that, I got heard my sort of inner Martin Luther come out. The 95 theses being nailed to the church door. But coming up, we're live outside Westminster Abbey with Prince William. Don't go anywhere. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello again. Here's your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. Some places towards the east may see a touch of frost, even a few patches of fog tonight. But for many, it is going to turn wet and windy due to an area of low pressure and an associated weather system feeding in from the west. We already have an occluded front across parts of Northern Ireland that has brought some rain earlier today, and that is going to bring more rain to northwest Scotland as we go through this evening and overnight. But it's across Northern Ireland where we're going to see some heavier rain and strong winds pushing in overnight and that rain then later reaching parts of western England, Wales and Scotland as we go through the early hours of tomorrow. Further east and there may be some clear spells in the cloud and so we could see a touch of frost, perhaps even a few patches of fog around first thing. Otherwise as we go through Tuesday a wet start and a windy start across western parts. The heaviest rain will be over higher ground, particularly over the hills and mountains of North Wales. The rain does ease a little bit as it pushes its way eastwards but most places will see some wet and windy weather for a time. We're going to see some milder air pushing its way in, so temperatures lifting a little bit higher than today, highs of around 13 or 14 Celsius. More wet weather to come as we go through the end of the day tomorrow. Whilst the outbreaks of rain do push their way towards the east, there are further outbreaks of rain pushing in from the west, again heaviest over any higher ground. More rain to come as we go through the rest of the week, particularly across northern and western parts, but it is going to turn milder, temperatures widely getting into mid-teens. Bye-bye. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Want to be a winner? You've won £18,000. I'm slipping neck. I don't know what to say. Enter our massive spring giveaway with three big seasonal prizes to be won. There's £12,345 in tax-free cash to give your finances a spring boost. We'll also send you on a shopping spree with £500 worth of vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. You'll also get a garden gadget package. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, Text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday the 29th of March. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Now then, Lee Anderson here. Join me on GB News on my new show, The Real World, every Friday at 7pm, where real people get to meet those in power and hold them to account. Every week, we'll be hearing your views from up and down the country in the real world. Join me at 7 on GB News, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. 
Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Good afternoon, Britain. It's two o'clock on Monday, the 11th of March. Commonwealth Day. Today marks the annual celebration of the Commonwealth of Nations, but Queen Consort Camilla will stand in King Charles's place this year as the monarch continues recovery from his cancer diagnosis. We're also expected to see Prince William. Kate apologises. More royal headlines as the princess issues an apology over manipulated photographs of her and her children released on Mother's Day. She says she was simply experimenting with editing. Now she's facing calls to release the original. And extremism in Britain. We'll hear from a survivor of the Manchester bomb attacks who has signed an open letter to isolate extremists which encourage violence and terror, terror groups. And of course, Lee Anderson's sensational defection this morning. The news that shook Westminster to its core. Yes, he's released a, a very long tweet explaining his decision. He says, the situation I find myself in today is that I am no longer part of the Conservative Party. The party have moved me aside, removed the whip as a result of me speaking the truth of the people, which will never change. He's very much saying that he speaks for millions of people up and down the country who want their country back. That's but let's what he remember says. what he said that meant that he was suspended from the Conservative Party. Mm -hmm. Not that there's a problem of Islamism in Britain, not that there are hate marches. Of course, Suella Braverman, the former Home Secretary, said all of those things. She's still a Conservative MP. What he said was that Sadiq Khan, the London mayor, was controlled by Islamists. He did also say the same about Sir Keir Starmer. He did. But even Richard Tice was saying that he put himself forward in a clumsy way. Mm. All he would have needed to do to stay a Conservative MP was to apologise to Khan and say, look, I, I messed up my words. I don't think you're personally controlled by Islamists. I just think you're a very weak mayor. That's all he had to say. Well, I guess he didn't want to answer to Sadiq Khan, who he's been very, very critical of um, for yonks. Um, so some people will see that as him standing by his principles. Do you believe that Lee Anderson is a man of principle? Of course, he has changed party. Uh, three, two, three, two, two, two times. Three parties, two changes. Yes, let us know what you yeah. think. GBviews at gbnews.com. Do you think the Reform Party is the rightful home for Lee Anderson? And could he win Ashfield under that banner? Really, really interesting questions. Another big question, who might be next? Richard Tice says that he would be surprised if there weren't more defections. So we're going to keep a beady eye on those, but that's after your headlines with Sam. Tom, Emily, thank you very much. Good afternoon from the newsroom. It's just after two o'clock. And the latest developments in our top story this hour, Lee Anderson has said that obliterating the Conservatives at the general election is not at the top of his gender agenda after announcing his defection to Reform UK, becoming the party's first MP. Mr Anderson was stripped of the Conservative whip after refusing to apologise for claiming that Islamists had got control of the London mayor. Polls suggest that around 13% of voters support reform and as recently as January, Mr Anderson had said that it was not a proper political party. But now, as Reform's newest member, he says that the new party will allow him to speak out on behalf of millions. Parliament doesn't seem to understand what many British people want. And quite frankly, some of them need to get out more. I made some remarks a few weeks back about the London Mayor. 
for which I was stripped of the whip in the, from the Conservative Party. And let me be clear, right now, on this stage, I will not apologise. It is no secret that I've been talking to my friends in Reform for a while, and Reform UK has offered me the chance to speak out in Parliament on behalf of millions of people up and down the country who feel that they're not being listened to. Well, uh, Jonathan Ashworth from Labour has said that it's another blow for the Prime Minister. What I think this reveals is the sheer chaos in the Conservative Party, a government divided from top to bottom and Rishi Sunak too weak to exert any authority and a divided government cannot govern in the interests of the country. I think people have had enough of this and after 14 years of failure, this proves once again that it is time for change. Royal News and the Princess of Wales has publicly apologised for an altered family photo released by Kensington Palace. Posting to social media, she admitted that, like many amateur photographers, she occasionally experiments with editing, adding that she was sorry for any confusion it may have caused. The Mother's Day image you can see here if you're watching on television, taken by the Prince of Wales, was withdrawn by various global photo agencies after suspicions were raised that a number of edits may have been made. Nottinghamshire Police has been told by a watchdog that it must urgently produce an improvement plan after it was put into special measures. The families of Barnaby Webber and Grace O'Malley Kumar have welcomed that news. The two teenagers and school caretaker Ian Coates died during a spate of knife attacks in Nottingham. The force has now been asked to improve how it manages and carries out effective investigations and to put measures in place that ensure victims get the support that they need. The energy regulator Ofgem is looking at ways to protect consumers from spiralling costs amid a record number of unpaid bills. Around £3.1 billion of debts are piling up as concerns grow over the high cost of household bills. It's after the price of energy in the average British home hit more than £3,500 a year last October. A major police operation is underway at a funeral director's after concerns were raised about how the dead were being treated there. There's a large number of officers visible in and around the area where those funeral homes are, including forensic officers and a maritime protection unit. We understand 350 people have now contacted the police about their ongoing investigation into three branches of legacy independent funeral directors. It comes after a 46-year-old man and a 23-year-old woman were arrested on suspicion of preventing a lawful and decent burial. 34 bodies have now been respectfully transported to a mortuary for formal identification. Passengers on board a flight from Australia to New Zealand endured a terrifying mid-air moment when the plane they were on unexpectedly dropped. 50 people were injured, with witnesses describing the chaos inside the cabin, saying some passengers were thrown to the ceiling with enough force to break roof panels. Twelve passengers, we understand, were taken to hospital when that flight landed in Auckland, with one person in a serious condition. The Boeing 787's sudden loss in altitude is still being investigated. LATAM Airlines says a technical event caused the sudden movement during that flight. And Malaysia has been offered £100 million to help in hosting the Commonwealth Games. The next Games are due to take place in two years' time, but they're currently without a host after Melbourne pulled out. The significant financial investment would see the event return to Kuala Lumpur after nearly 30 years. The Olympic Council of Malaysia says that a formal invitation is, has been received, but the Commonwealth Games Federation have declined to make a comment. Those are the headlines. More in the next half hour. In the meantime, you can sign up to News Alerts. Just scan the QR code there on your screen. Or if you're listening on radio, you can go to gbnews.com alerts. Good afternoon, Britain. It's eight minutes past two, and trust in the royals has taken a hit today in the wake of the Photoshop photo scandal. It's not a good start to what is the 75th Commonwealth Day. Yes, Development and Africa Minister Andrew Mitchell has spoken to GB News political editor Christopher Hope about what this all means. Andrew Mitchell, where are we? 
Well, we're on the roof of the British Foreign Office and uh, behind me is the most amazing uh, view. And in front of me, which viewers can't see, there's other sort of great views of uh, Whitehall and these fabulous statues. But we're, we're up here because today the Foreign Office is flying the Commonwealth flag. Which is over your right shoulder as the viewers look at you. Now, while that flag is important, is it flown enough? Well, we're going to fly it a bit more. It will be flown, for example, during the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, which takes place uh, in October later this year in Samoa in the Pacific. And I think it will also be flown during Commonwealth Education Week, which is incredibly important because one of the things that Britain is doing, along with our friends throughout the Commonwealth, is to try to drive forward girls' education and education uh, generally. So it's a very important moment, and that week will take place here in London. What is the point of the Commonwealth? I mean, do you worry that the critics on the left would say it's a, it's a hangover from empire and we should just get rid of it? No, I don't worry about that because the Commonwealth is clearly such a good thing. It is a family. We don't always agree on everything, but we have a pretty common set of values. We trade together, we do things together, we do development together, and we tackle climate change together, which, of course, the small island states throughout the Commonwealth suffer particularly from climate change and we all work together through a number of different mechanisms to try and uh, sort that out. So it's a wonderful organisation and it is above all a north-south organisation. And, uh, you know, there aren't that many which bring in the developed world and the developing world, the north and the south, stretching throughout the world. It's a very, very good thing. Is this place embarrassed about it? There's always a feeling that the Foreign Office is EU biased. Is it embarrassed about the Commonwealth at all? Not at all, no. And uh, this place uh, here, the Foreign Office, sees this year particularly a new king, the first of his big Commonwealth heads of government meeting. Uh, it's a, a very important time. It, we're coming to the end of uh, Patricia Scotland's time as uh, Secretary General. She's done a very good job. Um, and the Commonwealth really, I think, is pulling together now, doing things together, doing the things I just set out which really matter, and forging ahead. So the Foreign Office is the Foreign uh, Commonwealth and Development Office. Uh, the Commonwealth part of our title really matters. And I can tell you that David Cameron and I and Tariq Ahmed, the Commonwealth Minister, we are absolutely dedicated to bigging up and driving forward the Commonwealth and all it means. Will it be affected if some of the realms, or 14 realms, where our king is also other countries' king, if, if they say we don't want the king anymore, will that affect the Commonwealth? Well, as the king has always made clear, that's a matter uh, for them. But I think that the Commonwealth is enormously popular. It's, it's a wonderful organisation. Look at all the people who want to join it, the number of countries around the world who want to join the Commonwealth. I mean, that underlines what a great organisation it is. And particularly at this stage in its history, 75 years down, looking at the next 75 years, what we want to achieve uh, together. It's all very good news. It can keep going beyond the Queen, because, of course, the Queen, the late Queen, Queen Elizabeth II, set up the Commonwealth in the first place, and it's not going to wither away now she's gone. Well, she was a quite remarkable influence on the Commonwealth, partly because she knew everyone so uh, well, and they knew her. But, you know, the King, in his long apprenticeship as Prince of Wales, he too knows all these people across the Commonwealth, and it is his dedication, which, just like his mother... Uh, which uh, is so important to its future. See, do you want to see more people educated about it in schools, maybe? Because it's not really that well known. We're lucky enough to be here in the Foreign Commonwealth Office. But what does it mean to someone, let's say, in Ashfield or Derby? Well, I, th I, think, I think it is quite well known, but we can always do more. And, and we must try to do more because, it's, uh, uh, as I say, it's an organisation which is unique. And we need to build on its great benefits, some of which I've set out in this interview. Andrew Mitchell from the roof of the Foreign Office in London. Thank you for joining us today on GB News. Thank you. It's great to get an inside look there, an exclusive tour on the roof of the Foreign Office. As Chris was saying, the Foreign Office is often um, uh, sort of described as a really sort of Europhile organisation, something that's embarrassed about the Commonwealth, embarrassed about Britain's history. Um, but it seems like they're flying the Commonwealth flag today. Good step. Good step. Well, GB News Royal Correspondent Cameron Walker is live from Westminster Abbey and he's in amongst the crowds because there are quite a few anti-monarchy protesters everywhere. There they are with their yellow banners. Uh, Cameron, describe the scene for us. 
Well, Emily, it's incredibly noisy here outside Westminster Abbey, and there are three, at least three, separate protest groups. To my right, we have a uh, LGB, pro-LGBT uh, plus protest group who are voicing their concerns about the uh, rights of LGBT individuals in certain Commonwealth nations in Africa. Then, as you said, Emily, we have all these yellow signs behind me. This is the anti-monarchy campaign group Republic, thinking that the monarchy has... Uh, no rights when it comes to the Commonwealth family of nations and they should not be involved. And then on my left, we have another protest group, uh, all to do with Cameroon and the conflict there. So there are quite a lot of angry people here, but there are also 2,000 people, or there will be 2,000 people inside the Abbey and people around the world who support the work that the Commonwealth does. So it's the 75th anniversary this year, 56 independent nations from around the world, 2.6 billion people uh, are part of a Commonwealth nation. 60% of the population are actually under the age of 30 as well. So there's a huge emphasis on young people. Uh, it's all about this family of nations. That's the way they describe themselves, um, or, uh, kind of uh, uh, for democracy and peace and unity. King Charles is not going to be here because he is continuing his cancer treatment. But what he has done is released a video message which will be played for the first time later on this afternoon during that service. In it, he's going to talk about the Commonwealth being a precious source of strength, inspiration and pride. But what he also says during that message is that he will continue to serve the Commonwealth as its head to the best of my ability. Now, that phrase is very significant because that phrase was used by the late Queen Elizabeth II in June 2022 following the Platinum Jubilee celebrations, serving to the best of my ability. Now, as I said, the King's not going to be here, but Her Majesty the Queen will be representing him alongside the Prince of Wales, Duke and Duchess of Gloucester, Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh, Princess Royal, Tim Lawrence, uh, and the Duke of Kent as well. As I said, 2,000 people made up of people from across the Commonwealth and young people in particular. Uh, King Charles, in his message, will be talking about the environment in particular uh, and the need for young people. As, as the minister said, um, speaking to, to Chris Hope earlier on, a number of the Commonwealth nations are really struggling with climate change, particularly if they are uh, low-level nations and rising sea levels, of course, a huge concern for them. Uh, but it is very noisy and there is a lot of protests going on comes under the cloud of the murky situation of that photograph published on Mother's Day, now admitted to be doctored, a statement from Princess Catherine today saying that she holds her hands up, she doctored the photograph. Well, she said she experiments with editing, Tom, uh, clearly, and, and the uh, palace source described it as a minor adjustment to the image. I think it's fair to say it was a bit more than just airbrushing and changing the colour contrasts. Uh, uh, but in terms of the conspiracy theories that the photograph of, online saying that, for example, alleging that the photograph was not taken on the, the time that the Kensington Palace said it was. I think perhaps it's slightly far-fetched, although this is just speculation. I, I, the, what I, I expect happened is that Prince William took a number of photos and Kate took the best bits of all the photos and morphed it together. But clearly it was a bit of a clumsy edit and mm. Kensington Palace are now having to fight the flames. Yes, I guess we don't really know. Uh, Cameron Walker, thank you very much. GB News Royal Correspondent. Now, the uh, Princess of Wales uh, faux pas, we're yeah. going to discuss that a little bit more with royal photographer Ian Pelham-Turner, who better to talk to, really, about such a thing. Um, firstly, do you think Princess Catherine should have apologised and talked about how she likes experimenting with Photoshop? Uh, I guess it's very difficult to, to decide what to do in these circumstances. I mean... I it's, it's another mess, isn't it? Let's be honest. Um, it, it, I, I wake up every morning these days and I wonder what I'm going to comment on about the royal family that particular day. They seem to be very accident prone at the moment. And I think, you know, um, did she apologise? I, 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 it, it's a strange situation. The, the reality of when I was a photographer, I'm a broadcast now, but when I was a photographer, uh, for example, I did William's first Christmas baby shoot in uh, 1982. Uh, I was given seven minutes to actually do that, and we had to shoot uh, in a black and white camera and a colour camera, and we were given seven minutes. And in those days, the restrictions were you weren't allowed to talk to them, 
you weren't allowed to direct them in any way at all, and yet you represented to send those photographs out to 160 countries. So manipulation uh, wasn't even, even thought about in those days. Uh, and perhaps it would have made up my job easier. Certainly, sometimes when these things happen nowadays, I look at manipulation and it, I mean, it, it is what it is. Has it been taken at a different time? Where is uh, Kate's wedding ring? What are all the things that are going on in this photograph as well? Um, it's very strange. Even, for example, um, I, I'm hearing from the metaverse people who have looked at the picture that it might have been taken by a longer lens than it actually shows on, on the picture. I, I, I think there's a lot to be asked at the moment, and uh, whether Kate should have apologised, I suppose, you know, in, in reality, let's just, I think the British people need to know the truth at the moment. That's my, my uh, feeling on that. Do you think it shows the need for independent, professional royal photographers to uh, be invited into more settings like this, rather than keeping it sort of all within the firm. It shows the need for a free press to have access to uh, senior royals, even at times like this. I totally agree, because the, the reality is what, what, what happens now is that it's subject to controversy. And in reality, when, when these types of things happen, uh, if there are independent uh, photographers able to do this type of event. I mean, for example, when I was first started working with the royal family, I worked with five generations of the royal family behind the scenes as well. Um, and they chose me because I was a very young star photographer on a Fleet Street newspaper as well. Uh, and so they would elevate in those days a young star photographers like myself to actually give them a future. So that's why I did William's first baby shoes. But at the same time, when you listen to things like this today, trying to manipulate not only the imagery, but the people and the press as well, I, I think uh, the royal family really have got to think again about how they're actually performing. I mean, Ian, I should say that a lot of people are getting in touch who are very forgiving. They say it's a mistake a lot of people could make and uh, Princess Catherine has nothing to apologise. Everyone uses Photoshop and edits their pictures. But I do very much take your point that this wouldn't happen if it was done by a professional photographer who uh, arguably knew what they were doing. Mm, uh, yes. But uh, thank you very much, Ian Pelham-Turner. Really great to get your insight on this, a uh, former royal pho photographer. Very interesting. Yes, absolutely. Seven minutes only. Seven minutes. Yeah, and black and white and no talking. Yeah. Not even, not even look here. Very well, different time. Talking to a baby being christened probably wouldn't, wouldn't have helped much. You might get a giggle. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> um, but coming up in more serious news, 58 survivors of terror attacks have signed an open letter calling for an end to anti-Muslim hate. We joined very shortly by a signatory of the letter and a survivor of the Manchester Arena terror attack. Stick around for that. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 p.m. I've got an idea. I think that all 30-year-olds should be given £10,000 from the banks of baby boomers. We've got a situation in this country now where millennials are the first generation in modern times expecting to be poorer than their parents. We, as 30-year-olds like me, are half as likely to own a house as people my age 30 years ago. In fact, the cost of a home in Britain, compared to average incomes, has as big a gap today as it did, wait for it, in the 1860s. It is a Dickensian situation. Now, I'm sorry about the housing crisis for your generation. You're not, though, are you? No, because you're I profiting am. from it. I'm profiting from it. Don't be ridiculous. The house prices now, right. compared to that period. If this is the case, have, Benjamin. Have incomes gone up that fast? To, to penalise and punish the elderly when they have worked yeah. all their lives to put into the system and say, it's your fault, whingy whiny, we're going to yeah, be envious. Um, but, but no, Linda, no, we're no, being punished. No, well, by the politics, so be we're the change being punished you want to see taxes, in the world. Taxes, taxes, I am, actually. And I'm about to tell you about the change I want to see in the world. Are you good? As long as you're not whining about it. I'm going to not worrying about it, but the re we are being taken advantage of at the moment to profit, to help the old. Mo most of taxpayers' money is spent in two departments, the NHS, so the health department, 
and the Department for Work and Pensions. Those departments disproportionately serve the older population. Now, I've got no issue with that, but let's not pretend, let's not pretend that it is not young working people that is paying for the public services for old people. So actually, we are having it hard, and I just look at the future, and we see a future of perpetually higher taxes to pay for this increasing ageing population, a shrinking labour force, and you're here saying so we've got nothing to worry vote. about. The young stop voting for mass immigration parties, the young, I stop voting for Immigr parties Sorry, just to, that just don't to point out, build houses. Immigrants actually pay taxes, pensioners don't. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan, Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks, the admission's free. Join us every night on GB News at 11pm for Headliners, which is three top comedians going through the next day's news stories, which is exactly what you need, because when the establishment has gone crazy, you need some craziness to make sense of it. So join us 11pm every night on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. From 10am every Saturday, we want to make you think and we want to make you laugh. So we will give you all the top stories. Now we start with a story that has shocked the nation this week. But we're also going to make it light and fun and bring some entertainment in to make your Saturday morning nice and restful. Only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Well, it's 2.25, you're watching and listening to Good Afternoon Britain. Now, a total of 58 survivors of terror attacks inspired by Islamist extremism have signed an open letter calling for an end to anti-Muslim hate. They've also criticised some politicians for effectively equating being Muslim with being an extremist, which they argue makes the job of Islamist extremists easier and plays into the hands of terrorists. Well, we're now joined by one of the signatories of that letter, Paul Price, whose wife Elaine was very sadly killed in the Manchester Arena attack. Paul, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us this afternoon. So what You're does welcome. it mean to you to have signed this letter? In I essence, the letter seems to say that we need to isolate the extremists from moderate Muslims and that there should be no equation between the two. Yeah, that's, that's correct. I mean, judging all Muslims on the basis of the actions of extremists is wrong, and it just plays into what the terrorists want. I think uh, myself and all the other signatures on this letter coming from someone who's been directly affected by terrorism, you know, if anyone has a right to be filled with hatred, it's me. Um, and I think it's powerful for the message to come from someone like me to say that we're not we're not judging um, Muslims on the actions of you know a few extremists. No, of course, and it's a it's a powerful message. And, and Paul, I'm I'm so sorry to hear about your 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 personal situation, what you have gone through over these over these years. It must have been absolutely horrific. I I wonder if I wonder if there's a there's an issue here, whereby. Of course, there needs to be a distinction between moderate Muslims and extremists, but there also very often needs to be a conversation about how extremists are welcomed or otherwise within certain settings. And, uh, and I wonder if there is a risk here with some, of, with some of what this letter says that people might feel that they can't challenge extremism properly when it arises. Um, I mean... Extremism is, is, you know, it's not hard to, to spot. Um, and if there's people who are accepting them and welcoming them, well, what would, what would you call that? <laughs> um, so, I mean, I, I don't, you know, again, um, you know, again, judging all Muslims, you know, I, I, I can't see and extremism being accepted in the wider population. Um, I think everyone, um, the extremists are extremists, terrorists are terrorists. Uh, you know, they're not welcome at all. Do you, do you think that there are people in politics and the media who are equating terrorists and extremists with all Muslims? 
I think I think some of the language that it has been used is in like inflammatory, um, and sometimes you know as a politician, especially, they should be more careful with the words that they choose. And when we're looking at wider issues around awful attacks like the Manchester Arena, Arena bombing, but also in recent years, of course, we've seen London Bridge, we've seen a, a, a Member of Parliament assassinated, uh, we've seen so many incidents of this. What more do we need to do as society to uh, f point out and, and perhaps de-radicalise the extremists who do exist here? I think it's hard to uh, to de-radicalise. Um, I mean, I personally think you know the intellect has a lot to do with it. You can you can go online and be radicalised in an afternoon. You can be having a, a really nice day, go online, and within an hour or two, be filled with hatred. Mm. Um, a lot of um, Terrorists, you find, are, are easily swayed, um, easily led, and you know how to to deal with that is is really difficult. You know, we have the prevent scheme here in the UK, but it's it's voluntary. Um, there's there's a lot that goes on, obviously, that the public doesn't know about um, averting terrorist attacks, but obviously, it's the ones that don't get averted that we hear about and the consequences, as I so well know, are tragic. And Paul, just lastly, we spoke to a Muslim man earlier on in the show who said it is of the utmost importance that moderate Muslims speak out against extremists within the Muslim community. He said there's only so much sort of top-down government intervention can actually do. It has to come from within communities. Do you think that's fair? Yeah, I think it's, it's you know not just the Muslim communities, all communities to speak out. I mean, there's there's, there's right wing terrorists as well. So you know, all communities. Yeah, it's you know it should be us against the extremists, against the, the terrorists. We shouldn't be looking to demonise people and separate people by you know the language that is used. Well, Paul Price, thank you so much for sharing your story and so sorry again to her about your wife, Elaine, who was so sadly killed at the Manchester Arena attack. Thank you very time. much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank well, you. in other news, coming up, Lee Anderson sensationally defects to Reform UK, becoming the party's first representative in Parliament. We're going to bring you the very latest reaction. Lots of people have lots to say on this after your headlines. Tom, Emily, thank you very much. Good afternoon from the newsroom. It's just gone 2.30. A recap of the headlines this half hour. Lee Anderson says that beating the Conservatives at the next election is not at the top of his agenda. He became Reform's UK, Reform UK's rather first MP this morning after he was suspended by the Conservatives for claiming that Islamists had got control of the Mayor of London. Comes as polls suggest that around 13% of voters support reform and as recently as January, Mr Anderson had said that it was not a proper political party. But now Reform's newest member, he says that the party will allow him to speak out on behalf of millions. The families of Barnaby Webber and Grace O'Malley Kumar have welcomed news today that Nottinghamshire Police has been put into special measures. The two teenagers and school caretaker Ian Coates died during a spate of knife attacks in Nottingham. The force has been told by a watchdog that it must urgently produce an improvement plan amid concerns over how it carries out investigations. The energy regulator Ofgem is looking at ways to protect consumers from spiralling costs amid a record number of unpaid bills. Around £3.1 billion of debts are piling up as concerns grow over the high cost of household bills. It's after the price of energy in the average British home hit more than £3,500 a year last October. And Malaysia has been offered £100 million to help in hosting the Commonwealth Games. The event's due to take place in two years, but it's currently without a host after Melbourne pulled out. 
The significant financial investment would see the Games return to Kuala Lumpur after nearly 30 years. The Olympic Council of Malaysia says that a formal invitation has been received, but the Commonwealth Games Federation has declined to comment. For the latest stories, you can sign up to GB News Alerts by scanning the code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Hello again, here's your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. Some places towards the east may see a touch of frost, even a few patches of fog tonight, but for many it is going to turn wet and windy due to an area of low pressure and an associated weather system feeding in from the west. We already have an occluded front across parts of Northern Ireland that has brought some rain earlier today and that is going to bring more rain to northwest Scotland as we go through this evening and overnight, but it's across Northern Ireland where we're going to see some heavier rain and strong winds pushing in overnight and that rain then later reaching parts of western England, Wales and Scotland as we go through the early hours of tomorrow. Further east and there may be some clear spells in the cloud and so we could see a touch of frost, perhaps even a few patches of fog around first thing. Otherwise as we go through Tuesday a wet start and a windy start across western parts. The heaviest rain will be over higher ground, particularly over the hills and mountains of North Wales. The rain does ease a little bit as it pushes its way eastwards but most places will see some wet and windy weather for a time. We're going to see some milder air pushing its way in, so temperatures lifting a little bit higher than today, highs of around 13 or 14 Celsius. More wet weather to come as we go through the end of the day tomorrow. Whilst the outbreaks of rain do push their way towards the east, there are further outbreaks of rain pushing in from the west, again heaviest over any higher ground. More rain to come as we go through the rest of the week, particularly across northern and western parts, but it is going to turn milder, temperatures widely getting into mid-teens. Bye-bye. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Welcome back. It's uh, 37 minutes past two. This is uh, Good Afternoon Britain. And you've been getting in touch about Lee Anderson and his defection to Reform UK. Caroline says those asking for Anderson to call for a by-election are scared that Reform may take many of their seats in the next general election. It's funny the same people didn't call for a by-election after Lee was suspended from the party. Caroline, I don't quite get your logic there. They, they're, they're asking for a by-election because they're scared Reform would win it. Um, in the words of, who was it? Who was it? It was about when, when, when um, Gordon Brown refused to call a general election in 2007. I feel like it might have been David Cameron who said from the dispatch box of the House of Commons, he's the first person to not call election because he was too scared he would win it. <laughs> well, justice says... Lee Anderson has simply trodden the path of most Red Wall voters, from Labour to the Tories and now Reform. It will be interesting to see how many voters fo that follow him. That is a very interesting point indeed. Yes, the Conservatives are losing votes to Labour and to the Reform Party, 
the Labour Party is losing votes to the Reform Party too, although it doesn't really matter so much because they're on, what, 45%? Yeah. 46% yeah. in the polls. But that's interesting. I do, I do imagine quite a lot of people out there have taken that same journey. Labour, yeah. to the Conservatives under Boris, to now reform. How many there are and how they're dotted around the country mm. is the important thing when it comes to winning those constituencies. Well, and, and, and Ashfield is a constituency, very interesting constituency. The, 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 the party that came second mm. in the last election was the Ashfield Independents. Not Labour, not the Tories. Tories won, of course, but um, Ash Ashfield Independents came second. So really interesting political makeup there. But I think voters in general are more promiscuous <laughs> with their parties these days. We've got a much more promiscuous electorate. Do you mean uh, uh, fickle? I mean, promiscuous. You mean... They like to try. They like to sort of, you know, move from anymore. one to another. <laughs> it's not like they sign up to one and stay with it forever. Well, do you know what? I think a lot of people won't bother voting at all. Um, Steve says, I agree 100% with Lee defecting to reform where he can speak his mind. That's one of the main reasons he said he was defecting mm. to reform. He wants to speak uh, to the millions of people who he believes agree with him. I suspect vast numbers of the electorate agree with him, him and I wouldn't be surprised at all if he wins his seat for reform. Politics needs a good shake-up, Steve says. Well, this is interesting. Lots of people are demanding a huge shake-up in politics, whether mm. you're the politician like George Galloway or whether you're a politician like Lee Anderson or Richard Tice. Everyone wants a Shake up. People are sick of those two parties absolutely dominating. Mm. But whether con the Conservative message that a vote for reform is a vote for Labour in practice, are people listening to that? Well, let's get the views of GB News political editor Christopher Hope. Uh, Christopher, you've uh, spoken with Lee Anderson many, many times. Um, I, I suppose, first question when's he going to take his seat? When is he going to actually physically cross the floor to sit on the opposition benches? Well, hi, Tom. Hi, Emily. That's right. Tomorrow morning, around 11.30, there are no votes expected in the House of Commons today, so he's likely to, as you say, cross the floor. That's a term which a lot of people use in their private lives. What it actually means, it comes from the House of Commons, you cross the, cross the floor of the Commons from the government benches to somewhere up beyond where the SNP sit, if you know your geography of the House of Commons. So that'll be quite a big moment when that happens, not since 2014, Douglas Carswell joining UKIP has this kind of thing happened to this party or, the, or it's one of its forebears. So it's quite a moment, I think, when it does go. There's, it has caused a bit of a, of a shaking in the force amongst the Tory party. We've seen the New Conservatives saying, uh, use this opportunity to, to, re, to refocus the party on the right of politics. To, to answer Emily's question, uh, there are these parties, Labour and Tories, have so many similar policies now that, that, that according to uh, those on the right, the New Conservatives, they think that the party should lurch to the right and try and attract people who vote vote for right-wing policies. Well, we'll wait and see, but certainly it's been a very difficult time. The question now um, everyone else is asking in, in here in, in the House of Commons or in, in Westminster is who is next, mm. who might join uh, Lee Anson? Is this a kind of fracturing of the Red Wall or just a single person, an outlier? Um, Christopher, Nigel Farage has tweeted, Lee Anderson moving to reform is huge. I don't think Westminster really understands this yet. Um... Is that a bit of hyperbole, perhaps, from Nigel? Because, of course, Lee Anderson had the Tory whip removed. He didn't have that many options. I think uh, Nigel Farage, of course, is the honorary president of Reform UK Party. He's saying that in, 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 in terms of being a part, of, a part of, a, of a party, in that sense. He is saying that because he knows that Lee Anderson stands for something in the Tory party. Before he was, had his whip suspended two weeks ago, he was the person who would go around the country speaking to party association dinners on a Friday evening, trying to educate the South about their new friends in the North, which, which came to, over to the party in 2019. That's what he's saying. This guy has been called by the BBC. Um, he's a red wall made flesh. For many um, uh, supporters in the South of, of for the Tories, they look at the North, don't understand it. They see Lee Anderson and think, well, Here's the person who represents it and who we can understand. Um, I think with him gone, that's totemic, that's symbolic, uh, as Nigel Farage might say, were he here, of, of a fracturing of the support for the party in the North. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens next, Christopher. Richard Tice was teasing the audience at that press conference he called this morning, suggesting that he would be very surprised if there weren't any more defections to Reform UK by the end of the Parliament. I suppose the words on the lips of everyone in Westminster are, who's next? 
That's right, there's a double threat, wasn't there, Tom? Because he said, you know, have an election in May or you'll lose more MPs if you wait till October, November. That was a clear threat from him. Who's next? Well, there are all sorts of names. We, we probably should go to them first before naming them on air. Many are in the red wall with small majorities, sub-5,000, who, who, looking at the polls, have no chance of hanging on to their seats in the next election. So I think that is where we're looking, but we better not name names here. But there's no question it's a worry, a big worry for the Tory party. Who might follow them? Well, people can uh, guess for themselves who those Conservative MPs might be <laughs> who are reportedly, or, you know, allegedly, in advanced talks with uh, Richard Tice. Uh, thank you very much, Christopher Hope, our political editor there, live from Westminster, mm. bringing us the latest, as always. But tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning, just before our show, is when we, can, uh, when we can expect to see Lee Anderson walking across. I want to know precisely who he going to sit next to. Is that an awkward moment for Lee, or is Lee just the type of man who will just, you know, I do it with gusto? I think nothing in Lee's world is awkward. I think he's just got a supreme confidence of an individual who can walk past, doesn't mind what people shout at him or throw at him or whatever. Um, he'll walk across the floor. I want to know, does he sit next to the DUP, the Lib Dems? So the only thing someone's going to throw SNP. as an insult, perhaps. Yes, that's what I mean. Me metaphorical. <laughs> Me metaphorical, rather. I don't think we've quite descended to the days of the House of Commons where people sort of would lob things across from one side to the other. I'm not sure, actually sure that ever existed. It's a hypocritical story that the benches are set two sword widths apart. Well, we didn't see what happened in the past, did we? Because there was no... Uh... Photography there from inside the there, room. There wasn't even an official so there press been, gallery there or, been or, or a recognised lobby. Um, there wasn't until um, it was Charles Dickens who was involved in setting that well, there up. There you go. A lobby there's reporter some, once upon a time. There's some trivia for you for yeah. your next pub quiz. <laughs> anyway, annual celebrations break out across the country for Commonwealth Day, but does Britain still fly the flag for the monarchy? We'll be joined by a royal expert. is GB News, Britain's news channel. Now, I'm sure you have seen this video that went viral this week, and if you I haven't, haven't well, I think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, this is a firefighter leaning on a fence whilst watching a trapped driving instructor's car sink <laughs> in four feet of flood water. Looks very comfortable there, doesn't he, just leaning against the just fence? Just chilling, just yeah. relaxing. <laughs> uh, yeah, there were two... Uh, so there were, in fact, two Essex fire and rescue crews, an ambulance and a police car parked near the sinking vehicle, but they wouldn't enter the water because they had to wait for specialist crews who were trained for, for the water depth. Uh, well, two people who weren't going to sit back and watch were these two, Jack and Danielle Price, who took it upon themselves to rescue the submerged driver. And Danielle joins us now. Very good morning to you, Danielle. And you are a hero, an absolute hero. What happened in this video? Make sense of it for us. So we were filming in the area for our YouTube channel and we've seen the fire brigade come through. I was actually out at five o'clock in the morning with my husband, Jamie. We, we know it always happens there, as you can see. Um, and it was clear. We've seen the fire brigade come through, we've followed them, and they're just standing around as if nothing's happened. Um, in the clip, it says um, he's fine, he's, he's, in, he's on his phone, um, and then sort of walked away. But what they failed to realise is when my partner actually opened the door, as you can hear, He's on the phone to the, the the sort of the emergency crew in panic, thinking he's going to sink. Um, so we could not just sit there and watch. Um, he's absolutely terrified. Yeah, poor bloke. Well done, you. Do you reckon this is health and safety gone mad? It is because although I do sympathise with them, they are so red taped. But surely, sort of common sense has to kick in as open the door. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. 
That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. It's 2.48, you're watching listening to Good Afternoon Britain. Now, the Prince of Wales is accompanying the Queen at the Commonwealth Service at Westminster Abbey today. The King will not be in attendance, however, under doctor's orders, but he's recorded a video message pledging to continue to serve the Commonwealth to the best of his ability. Yes, well, GB News Royal Correspondent Cameron Walker is live from Westminster Abbey. I imagine all eyes will be on Prince William, considering that everything that's happening at the moment. Yeah, I think they certainly were, Emily, and there was a lot of eyes and a lot of noise here about five minutes ago as members of the royal family arrived at Westminster Abbey uh, ahead of that Commonwealth Day service celebrating 75 years of the Commonwealth. But about 10, 15 minutes before, a paparazzi photographer captured William and Catherine in the car together, leaving Windsor on their way towards London. Now, I understand the Princess of Wales uh, is at a private appointment, so she is definitely not inside the Abbey. But as you say, Prince William certainly is. Now, the whole point of a Commonwealth is 56 independent nations working towards democracy, peace and showing unity. King Charles is head of the Commonwealth, and although he cannot be here in person due to that ongoing cancer treatment, he has recorded a video message message which will be played in the next hour inside the Abbey. In it, he talks about the precious source of uh, the Commonwealth being a precious source of continued strength, inspiration and pride. But what he also said was he will continue to serve to the best of my ability. Now that phrase, best of my ability, is one we've heard before from his mother, the late Queen Elizabeth II. She used that phrase, continued to serve, to, committed to serve to, this, uh, to the best of my ability at the end of the Platinum Jubilee celebrations in June 2022. Now, so all the members of the royal family, are uh, working members of the royal family, uh, are in size behind me, apart from uh, Princess Alexandra, uh, the Princess of Wales, who, of course, continues to recover, and uh, obviously His Majesty the King as well. But there is a 2,000-strong congregation here. Now, 60 percent of everybody who lives in the Commonwealth, that's 2.6 billion people, are um, under the age of 30. So there's a strong emphasis on young people and indeed climate change. And King Charles is expected to mention climate change uh, in his speech. A number of Commonwealth nations are low-lying nations, which uh, it, there is a genuine threat uh, of rising sea levels for them. And that is something the Commonwealth is collectively working towards. But of course, it was incredibly noisy when members of the royal family arrived here. Three separate protest groups, um, a, a pro-LGBT rights voicing their concerns about the rights of LGBT people in certain Commonwealth nations. Then we had the anti-monarchy group Republic behind me. They're the people with the big yellow signs. They were chanting down with the crown over and over again, holding up signs saying, not my king. And then we had a separate protest group um, voicing concern about the conflict in Cameroon. So an incredibly noisy 75th anniversary of the Commonwealth. Interesting there, Cameron, that you mention seen in the car together the Princess and the Prince of Wales. That will uh, raise some eyebrows and perhaps be a deliberate decision to try and settle some rumours. But uh, Cameron Walker, thank you very much. Live from Westminster Abbey, appreciate your time. Well, let's discuss this further with former royal correspondent Charles Ray. Charles, a very big day for the royal family. Uh, yes, in, in more ways than one. Uh, I mean, the Commonwealth uh, uh, service is a very, very big event in any of the royal diaries. You know, it's a coming together of the 56 countries. They're paying homage to the Commonwealth. It's been going for 75 years. OK, there's been a few disagreements. A few countries have decided to, to leave the Commonwealth. But most of those that have left are still loosely linked with the Commonwealth and still, you know, enjoy... Uh, the, uh, the 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 getting together uh, as well, and I don't see any reason why that shouldn't continue. No, it is interesting though that it comes under this cloud of uh, of, a, of a media storm about a, a photoshopped photograph, a manipulated photograph, some sort of composite image that was meant I'm... to clear up all of the rumour and scandal, and has only served to ignite it further. Tom, I'm glad you've asked me about this because I am appalled at the amount of guff and nonsense that's spoken about this photograph today. I think this is a beautiful photograph. 
Yeah, and you would think with all the people that are jumping up and down the bandwagon about photoshopping and everything else, you'd think that the Princess of Wales is being accused of child abuse because she's she's altered some uh, sleeve on it. It's a great photograph. It was meant to be a Mother's Day photograph, and she took the opportunity to say thanks very much. And honestly, the stuff that I've been watching and, and, and listening to on Twitter, it's driving me around the bend, to be perfectly honest. I mean, people are actually complaining about the foliage in the background, sort of saying it can't be right, you know, because the foliage is wrong. I mean, how many gardening experts are there out there that are complaining about this photograph? I mean, leave the girl alone. She's just doing, she's doing as best she can. And I've just seen that photograph that you were talking about with William and Catherine. Mm. It was great to see them in the car together. I gather she's going off to a private appointment and William uh, is now at, at the Abbey. Yeah. But honestly, the stuff that's being said and spoken about right. this photograph is Charles, just... I'm afraid we've run to the end <laughs> of, the, of the show, actually. But really important point for you to make. And, of course, there are evergreen trees. But, Charles Ray, former royal correspondent at The Sun, thank I you for your know. time. I don't know. Um, I Martin don't know. is coming up next. What's on your show? Yeah, hi guys, so I want my country back. The Red Wall Rottweiler. Is this b the beginning of a Red Wall revolution or will it fizzle out? Plus an exclusive interview with um, Niak Korbani. He, of course, was the guy with the, with the poster saying Hamas is terrorist. We'll have a first exclusive interview with him. We'll have Anne Willicombe on the show, plus an exclusive interview with Darren Frost. He was the Narwhal Tusk attack. You remember from the London Bridge terror attack. We've got him on about the rise of extremism. But first, it's time for your latest weather forecast. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello again. Here's your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. Some places towards the east may see a touch of frost, even a few patches of fog tonight. But for many, it is going to turn wet and windy due to an area of low pressure and an associated weather system feeding in from the west. We already have an occluded front across parts of Northern Ireland that has brought some rain earlier today, and that is going to bring more rain to northwest Scotland as we go through this evening and overnight. But it's across Northern Ireland where we're going to see some heavier rain and strong winds pushing in overnight and that rain then later reaching parts of western England, Wales and Scotland as we go through the early hours of tomorrow. Further east and there may be some clear spells in the cloud and so we could see a touch of frost, perhaps even a few patches of fog around first thing. Otherwise as we go through Tuesday a wet start and a windy start across western parts. The heaviest rain will be over higher ground, particularly over the hills and mountains of North Wales. The rain does ease a little bit as